Hey, um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting by Starleaf and our witnesses for today's briefing will also be attending by Starleaf. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage it's on the Assembly website. Just to remind members to mute their devices by pushing F4. Um, so moving on then, item number one is apologies. We have apologies this morning from Gordon Dunn and also from Christopher Stalford. Um, we hope you are feeling better quickly. Yeah. Um, moving on then, item number two, draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of September at page five of your packs. Are members content that these are, are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Yep. Okay. Um, item number three then, Chair of Persons Business. We have nothing listed for that this morning. And then, so moving on uh, swiftly to our, our, our first briefing this morning, um, which is from the, our economist on the economic situation and recovery. There is a clerk's memo at page 14. There's a departmental briefing paper um, the COVID-19 additional allocation <laughs> exercise at page 17. Departmental briefing economic recovery in the medium term at page 44. A report commissioned by the Department on Integrated Economic Skills and Innovation Policy Agenda at page 58. Um, so members will recall that we, we as a committee thought it would be very useful to hear from economic er experts before receiving a briefing from the Minister next week. So I'd like to welcome um, to our meeting this morning, and if we could bring them into the spotlight please, um, Richard Ramsey who is an economist at Ulster Bank and Paul McFlynn who uh, is an economist at the Nevin Institute. So if I hand over to yourselves and if you would like to make an opening statement and then we will open it up to um, questions and I think Richard you're going to go first, is that correct? Okay, uh, well good morning everybody and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address the committee. I suppose what I want to just uh, br briefly uh, address in an opening statement is uh, where the economy has come from, where it is, what, where it's going to go and what are the challenges and the ability to recover and long-term challenges and priorities, etc. And uh, I suppose to begin with, even before the pandemic struck, the Northern Ireland economy was in recession. Uh, if you look at uh, the PMI survey, it's recorded now six consecutive quarters of contraction. And if you look at the official uh, NISRA's official uh, Northern Ireland economic com or Composite Economic Index, which is the nearest thing Northern Ireland has to uh, quarterly GDP, it recorded uh, two, uh, its first quarter of recession in Q3 of last year, again in Q4, again in Q1, a record rate of decline. So that's three already. And then, of course, Q2 is going to see the economy... Uh, fall at uh, a record rate and essentially Q2 is going to be represent rock bottom for the economy from a from an output perspective. And while I said that the economy was in recession uh, last year and going into this year, that was from an output perspective. From a labour market perspective, we were still having last year uh, flirting with, uh, we had record lows in unemployment, skills shortages, and pretty much that carried into uh, this year as well. But to just sort of like look at the, the scale of the contraction that we're going to uh, e experience or we're going to see uh, whenever the figures are, are eventually released for Q2, we're probably going to see output fall by about 25 to 30%. And uh, to put that in perspective, it took in the last recession, it took six years for the, the composite index to fall uh, the composite index to fall 10% and for the private sector component to fall 13%. So effectively, what Northern Ireland is going to experience, has experienced, because it was in Q2, two, and a half, two to two and a half times the decline that occurred in the last recession in six years in a single quarter. So when we put that all together for, for 2020, I expect the economy is going to shrink for the year as a whole by, by between 12 and 15 percent. And uh, that's probably over 10 times the risk, the scale of the recession that I was predicting at the start of the year before COVID struck. So what we have seen is all the Q2 has seen these freak indicators come in thick and fast. 
where we've had the likes of new car sales fall uh, 76 percent year on year residential property transactions down over two-thirds on a year by year, year on year basis uh, even on the non-residential or commercial property side transactions in the second quarter down almost 60 percent year on year and house building the rate of which uh, new dwellings have been completed or finished that's down at its fastest rate on records by 61 percent year on year in q2 and we've seen that with uh, in terms of job vacancies as well the uh, nijobs.com and ulster bank employment report the vacancies listed on that website they they fell by over half uh year on year in uh, the second quarter and the likes of the hospitality sector was seeing 90 percent drop on year on year and even when you look at within that quarter april may and june you're seeing uh, even more stark figures where even in the likes of car sales where in, in the month of april which was the first month of lockdown sales were down 99 percent so that shows you the sort of context Q3 in terms of output recovery is underway and indeed in aspects of some of the sectors recovery things were improving in May relative to April and June relative to May but Q3 should see the start of uh, uh, output growth and indeed the PMI for July and August has, has revealed that however the pace of growth that the PMI is signalling for Northern Ireland's private sector growth uh, in August 51.7% is uh, disappointing and it's certainly not a kind of v-shaped recovery of what people might have hoped for also what is concerning it, with the lack of momentum going into uh, the rest of the year as new orders are contracting significantly again so th that is a concern we will see a rebound though in terms of economic growth as a whole next year just because of how how much we have fallen you're probably going to see a, something in the ballpark of maybe a 10% rise after the 12 to 15% fall. That sounds impressive, but remember, we're probably only going to have got back about two thirds of the lost output by the end of next year. And it's in the first year that that's where the low hanging fruit uh, are plucked uh, uh, in the most uh, quick, quickest way and easiest manner. Uh, the recovery will get more difficult and it will slow as time goes on and my expectation is we're not going to see the economy return to its pre-COVID-19 sort of uh, levels of activity probably until about late 2024 early 2025 so it's a kind of four to five year recovery timeline we have seen encouraging signs of recovery but it's important to stress that they're coming off record lows. So we have seen the likes of car sales in July, best July in 13 years. And we also saw another increase in uh, August, but car sales for the first eight months of the year are still down 40% relative to where they were last year. If you look at residential property transactions as well, they have seen numbers of transactions in July quadrupled relative to April's lockdown low but you're still seeing levels of activity for the first seven months of the year, half of what it was last year. That's kind of the same for job vacancies as, as well. So you have seen an increase in vacancies advertised after the, after the April low, up 56% by June, but they're still half of what they were last year. So where are we now? Effectively, we're, I, I would sort of term, we're in this kind of eye of the storm. We've had the sort of hurricanes hit and there's been a lot of collateral damage uh, caused. Uh, lifting of the restrictions and reopening of the economy has certainly uh, made the economic environment uh, has improved. But unfortunately, this is not the end of it. We are going to see another wave of uh, another storm is going to hit and indeed, this is going to be most marked in the labour market where there is more uh, damage to come on, on the labour market front, the, more ahead of us than we've actually had already. We have to bear in mind that uh, we've had an unprecedented level of government support, uh, which has effectively uh, prevented an economic collapse. And one of the flagship measures of that was, was the furlough scheme or the job retention scheme. 
and it at this stage is due to expire at the end of October. And on that basis, I would anticipate that you will see Northern Ireland's very low unemployment rate at the minute, 2.9%, catapulted uh, up into high single digits, and ultimately I would expect it to exceed 10%. The younger generation, the 18 to 24s, are going to bear the brunt of this, and I would anticipate that uh, youth unemployment rate would be uh, expected to hit around 25%. We're also going to see then as we go into the new year, uh, we're going to anticipate a wave of insolvencies. And remember, whenever we're hearing about the businesses reopening, it is one thing reopening a business, it is quite another to make that business profitable and viable. And that's gonna be a key challenge uh, as we go into uh, 2021. So I suppose in terms of the recovery, looking at some of the, uh, uh, what, what should the uh, short-term uh, priorities be? And, uh, you know, the response in terms of the government's response in terms of providing comprehensive uh, financial packages uh, quickly has been relatively good, although some areas of the, the economy, such as the art sector, are still waiting for funding. So a key priority going forward is to continue to open the economy up as much as possible, using technology where appropriate in order to do that, and how we can facilitate uh, and promote economic activity. This is particularly important for the public sector in terms of facilitating the delivery of uh, public services. Uh, deficiencies in technology were highlighted during the lockdown period as, as being a problem which was stymieing some economic activity. And uh, I suppose it's important what lessons were learned there, how have those deficiencies uh, been uh, addressed to cope with uh, potential other localised lockdowns and disruption going forward. The other main challenge is going to be dealing with the surge in unemployment. Uh, how you actually manage that and alleviate it as much as possible. I would be very surprised if we don't see uh, the UK Chancellor unveil more uh, employment support schemes. Not as good as the furlough, uh, not as good as the, the, the furlough, as generous as the furlough scheme, which was a blanket support, but more targeted and uh, uh, support, I, I think, such as wage subsidies whatever, I would be very surprised if that isn't in, in, introduced. The younger generation needs to be targeted and we've already seen things such as rolling out more apprenticeships, uh, more places for FE, HE, etc, which is all uh, important because ultimately in the younger generation I think the biggest legacy from uh, COVID-19 is going to be the impact on our school, child school children, the uh, education that they've already lost. We're going to see a increase in the divergence in educational outcomes, particularly with those children from more disadvantaged backgrounds falling further behind. And it's important in the short term that those educational potholes are addressed and filled in as quickly as possible because that impacts on our skills pipeline uh, in the future. Looking at some of the other key sort of short to medium term priorities, one of the biggest challenges is going to be an indebtedness on, on the corporate sector. In, this, in the space of a few months, we've seen the banks lend in effectively emergency funding over £1 billion uh, to local businesses. And that's effectively, they've done that, uh, lent that money in the space of uh, several months, what they would normally lend in uh, several years. And uh, this is going to act on, while we'll expect uh, many of the firms to repay this debt back quickly in, in the new year. Others are going to find it difficult to pay this debt back and actually deal with this on an ongoing basis. So this debt burden is going to uh, uh, impact on SMEs, going to impact on their growth potentials. It's going to constrain them from being able to uh, borrow to invest in the future. So one of the key things is going to be for the economic recovery is how that debt is dealt with. This has been looked at at a, at a kind of UK level at the minute and whether, you know, how, how that debt can be reduced, uh, removed, or uh, uh, how these fir uh, firms can be recapitalized. Uh, other sort of longer term, medium to longer term issues are the skills deficit, which 
uh, never seems to be addressed in an adequate manner. And by that, I mean Northern Ireland continues to churn out a higher proportion of school leavers with no skills or qualifications than any other UK region. It has improved on that over the years, but it's still the worst within the UK. This is a huge barrier to, uh, uh, in, in terms of our creating or plugging some of our skills deficits if people don't even have the basic skills. And it's also a huge cost in terms of the social uh, outcomes and uh, expenditure that then has to lead, uh, has to follow that as well. Deficits are also apparent in the infrastructure side, particularly in terms of uh, funding our wastewater infrastructure, where it has gone beyond urgent on that front. It is a, the lack of funding. It's a barrier to growth and development, particularly within Belfast. A lot of our ambitious plans that we have to develop uh, linked to the likes of uh, uh, city deals, etc., cetera, are, are going to be pipe dreams unless you have the uh, water infrastructure addressed. Also on the infrastructure side, telecoms infrastructure, we're seeing that and sort of rolling out more in super fast broadband, et cetera. That's incredibly important. It's also a great opportunity now for trying to get more social inclusion across Northern Ireland and also in terms of between East and West in terms of economic development. With the new working from home era, era there's uh, opportunity for more offshoring uh, from uh, GB and the Republic of Ireland and even Dublin, but that depends on having the quality infrastructure and telecoms uh, in place. That's also important for education as well, as we can see during the lockdown period where there was uh, digital uh, inequalities uh, in, in terms of people's access to, to broadband and therefore the ability to learn. Another key area is the whole issue of good governance. We are competing with cities and regions around the world and across these islands and a critical driver uh, or inhibitor to economic competitiveness is the effectiveness and efficiency of all layers of government, be it local, uh, district council level, or at a, like Stormont executive level. The ability to deliver is key. City deals are a great opportunity for Northern Ireland, uh, more funding, but the actual ability to deliver uh, is, is more important. And uh, that's particularly when it comes to infrastructure investment where Northern Ireland's track record of being able to deliver infrastructure investment in a timely manner uh, is poor. Uh, legal challenges, procurement and tender difficulties, etc. We've got to the stage where Northern Ireland is recognised as the judicial review capital of the UK, and this urgently needs to be addressed. If we want to have world-class infrastructure, we have to have world-class processes and organisations being able to deliver on that. I suppose then the sort of other challenges that uh, lie ahead are Brexit is another uh, headwind where at the minute businesses simply don't have the bandwidth to deal with that because they've got enough issues and problems to deal with. You've also got issues such as climate change, which presents both threats and opportunities, also adapting to an aging population as well. And uh, when we look ahead, I think Northern Ireland is going to need to adapt to many of the adapt to the new world that COVID-19 has thrown up because what COVID-19 has done is it's, it's in many ways it's accelerated trends which were already there such as uh, digital uh, adoption and digital adoption such as working from home such as continuing challenges for for the high street and uh, these need to be embraced uh, both in terms of digital technology and how working from home is going to uh, change the way we the way we work, both in the public and private sectors going forward as well. So that's my kind of summary of things in the the world and the economy as I see it. Thanks, Richard. Um, Paula, I hand over to you then. Uh, <clears throat> okay, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so, look, thanks for, for having me come along uh, to, today. Um, I think as, uh, as, as Richard outlined in, in, in the first part of his presentation, when we're looking at the, the impact of COVID-19 on the Northern Ireland economy, we were still obviously dealing with a very fluid situation 
um, and uh, the, the scale uh, of, of the crisis that we're dealing with uh, at the moment uh, is, is, is throwing up numbers that we've, uh, we've never really uh, encountered uh, before. I think in terms of what I wanted to, to, to talk about and to focus in on, um, obviously in terms of, of the work here at the Institute as well, is, is very much focused on the, the labour market impacts um, uh, that, we're, that we're likely uh, to see. Um, and where we think we are uh, at present and what the future prospects are and what that means very much for, for, for policy. I think there are four broad points I'd like to, to, to make. The first would be that the time scale or the, the time frame of this crisis has changed uh, considerably since, uh, since March, since we made the first significant uh, economic uh, inter intervention into the, to the labour market for this crisis. Uh, I think that the, the situation we're currently in um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of employment and the labour market is actually, um, it actually we're, we're likely to be, it's likely to get worse than what it currently uh, appears. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And I think, um, and Richard referred to this as well, I think the, the, the prospect of a bounce back uh, recovery, which a lot of people had been um, forecasting for some time um, is, is, is fading uh, fast. I think we have to accept that a certain, uh, obviously a certain amount of employment uh, has, been, has been lost, um, but I think we have to come around to the idea that a certain amount of that employment may have been lost uh, permanently, um, and that has significant implications for, for our policy uh, response. And the furlough scheme is obviously um, is obviously uh, the the main uh, intervention that we that we that we've been policy intervention we've been discussing, and the the most um, the most pressing issue is that it's going to to end at the end of uh, of October, and um, we can have discussions on when the most appropriate time for it to end would be. But the fact is, it's going to have to end uh, at some point. And uh, uh, we probably need to start having the conversation more about what's going to replace it rather than, uh, than how much longer we can, we can push it on for. So in terms of the, in terms of the first point, uh, in terms of the time scale or time frame of the, of the crisis, back in March, when, um, when the furlough scheme and, uh, and its uh, self-employment counterpart were, were first um, put together, we were very much dealing with a crisis we thought was going to be measured in weeks, possibly months. Um, and the idea of, of furlough being that we would, you know, freeze the economy uh, as and the labour market as it was, and then, you know, take it back out and defrost it uh, once it um, once the, the the pandemic or certainly the acute phase of the pandemic um, was was over. We were very much dealing with the idea that we were going into a hard lockdown and then a a, a gradual but but a total uh, release uh, from that that phase. That picture has changed dramatically uh, since uh, since March. One of the most important the most important aspect of furlough uh, from a labour market uh, uh, intervention point of view is that it preserves the relationship between employers and employees. Um, making it much easier for the economy to rapidly readjust once uh, once the acute phase is, is over. Um, it doesn't really work if the ground has shifted um, over the over the period uh, of the of the crisis, and that is more than likely the case um, um, that we have that we have seen uh, over the last uh, few months. In terms of in terms of where we are uh, where we are now. Um, this kind of touches on on, uh, on, a, on what Richard mentioned uh, in terms of it's one thing to, to reopen a business, it's another thing to make it uh, profitable. And I kind of think that at the moment, unfortunately, we're, we're in a kind of a sugar rush um, phase uh, of recovery where you will have a lot of firms who were who faced uh, very uh, restrictions which closed them um, during uh, lockdown. And as the restrictions lifted um, in the initial uh, phase uh, in June, uh, May, June, July, that these firms have attempted to get back to, to normal trade uh, as quickly as possible, um, in the hope that um, that getting back up and running um, would be a, would be a boon to their to their to their longer term recovery. In many of these cases, they're facing increased costs. They're facing, particularly in terms of staffing, whether that's having to have more uh, staff than usual in, in terms of managing social distancing or increased cleaning. 
and in many cases they're also dealing with reduced trade whether that's um, the fact that uh, restrictions still mean they can only uh, have a certain amount of custom or whether there has just generally been a change in, in attitudes or consumer um, behavior that operating on that kind of model is fine if you thought that the restrictions were going to peter out um, uh, almost completely by the end of the summer um, that's not what we're what we're facing now. But the reality is that we're going to look at a period of of, of sort of long lingering uh, restrictions, with the possibility of a uh, of a fallback or a regression, um, kind of at any point um, uh, in the future. So that kind of business model isn't uh, isn't sustainable uh, in that kind of environment. And unfortunately, um, uh, it's more than likely that the significant uh, employment fall off uh, from from those type of, uh, of firms so when we when we were looking at, at how recovery was going to take hold earlier on in in, in 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 the year lifting restrictions was going to be the key to that once we could lift restrictions then things would 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 would, would bounce back and i don't think that's that's going to be the case for a lot of um for a lot of uh, sectors in the economy and you know, uh, considering that now we're talking about uh, talking much more cautiously about possible vaccines and possible treatments, you know, uh, it could be that the specter of uh, of, uh, of the reintroduction of restrictions hangs over large parts of our economy um, for uh, for for months, if not if not in many cases, uh, uh, possibly years. So, given this, in terms of the policy space. It's understandable why many people from across the spectrum have said, you know, ending the furlough scheme um, with the kind of cliff edge, um, slightly graduated cliff edge, uh, in October is, um, is 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 quite dangerous. And I, I I think so too. And I think now that we're in the middle of of, of September, and um, the idea that it's going to to end completely in in six weeks um, is 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 really quite quite scary. Um, but a replacement for furlough uh, for the furlough scheme is inevitable, and that the furlough scheme is can be used uh, for a very specific type of uh, of, of crisis, um, a very time limited demand or supply uh, shock. If we look back to two thousand and eight, when we last saw a, a significant um, disruption to, to our labour market, a shock, a furlough scheme wouldn't have been appropriate then. If you think about it. The crisis first entered the Northern Ireland labour market in the construction sector. If we had put in place a furlough scheme for construction workers, you know, some of them would eventually have returned uh, to to construction jobs, but the mass vast majority of them uh, of them wouldn't. In 2008, we had a construction sector which had grown to much larger than its historical average, or even by international um, uh, standards, in terms of its share of the uh, of the economy. In the immediate crash, we lost over a third, 36 uh, percent of jobs uh, immediately. But even now, we are 20 percent um, below where we were in 2008. So, if we had a furlough scheme and that was all we we did, we would have um, at the end we would have eventually had to um, um, people would have fallen out of the scheme um, without uh, without those uh, without those jobs to go back to, and without wanting to be alarmist. We do have to face the possibility that certain other sectors of our economy, whether it's hospitality or leisure or the arts, are possibly going to face um, a, a, a situation where they um, where they have a, a certain amount of jobs that just simply uh, aren't coming back. So, in that case, if furlough isn't the most appropriate uh, policy intervention, uh, what is? Um, and I think in terms of the mindset of how we're dealing with this crisis, we have to move from protecting jobs to protecting workers. Um, furlough was very useful and very um, effective because it absorbed the in initial shock um, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the lockdown. But in reality, if we had had a proper social security or income protection scheme um, like they have in uh, many economies in, in Europe, it would, have, it would have acted as the same kind of uh, initial uh, shock uh, absorber. We didn't have that, so, so furlough was necessary. But in the longer term, a retraining and re uh, scheme is going to be necessary to prevent um, large-scale unemployment, not just short-term, um, but, but long-term. 
And why do I say this is necessary? Because if you look back to 2008, people will say, well, yeah, we had the hit to the construction sector. The construction sector didn't come back to where it was, but the rest of the economy did. Employment, uh, we eventually made up the, the, the jobs that, that we lost. That's true. The difference is that in 2008, it took a very long time um, uh, for that to happen. And also, and I think this is a crucial point, that the kind of sectors that we would have seen make up the difference, the kind of sectors we would have seen grown to take the, you know, to take the, um, to take what had uh, been lost from construction, those kind of uh, service sectors, those kind of fast-growing sectors, are the sectors that are going to be most hit from um, from this crisis and going to be, going to be most constrained um, in the restrictions uh, that remain. So we don't have that kind of organic capacity to recover uh, from from this that we've had maybe in in, in previous uh, recessions, um, and so that's uh, I think that's why we, we we do need a significant intervention, probably as, as a financial uh, intervention, a significant furlough, but something um, uh, for the more longer term. So I think to 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 summarise, we can't have furlough end in October with nothing to to replace it. The situation is probably a bit worse than than what it currently um, uh, appears. We can't expect uh, bounce back, and I think we can't uh, we can't expect the kind of uh, recoveries that we've had in in, in previous uh, recessions. And if we're looking for where we would focus uh, a reemployment and reinvestment uh, scheme, I think Richard gave a very good summary of where our infrastructural deficits uh, are there. And I think if we broadened it out to what Northern Ireland's uh, challenge is with regard to the climate crisis, I think we could find many more um, uh, challenges uh, in there. But um, I think uh, if that's OK, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you both very much for um, those very stark presentations. Um, and I, I guess it is. Uh, quite a bleak outlook, although it isn't a great surprise to us uh, at this point. Although some of the figures are are quite, um, yeah, they're quite stark to say the least. Um, I guess in terms of where we are are now, you know, it seems like we're still only in the early stages of this. Um, and as we try to respond um, to the, what is still, I suppose, to some extent, a mitigation phase. Um, and we do, we do still have the, the furlough scheme obviously in place for the time being, uh, but as, as we begin to move forward, um, are there models elsewhere that are being used in terms of recovery? Um, and I, I think of the likes of France and Germany where they have already stated that they're extending their equivalence of the furlough schemes until um, 2021, I think end of 2021, maybe even 2022 for France. Um, and if you look at the, the furlough scheme in, in Germany, I think it actually increases the amount that it subsidises employers with um, over time rather than, than decreases it, which is, um, I, I suppose, a different approach to, to what we're seeing. Um, but in terms of that cliff age um, that we're potentially looking at and what replaces it, are there examples that we could be looking to? Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Just to say, I think um, and it's quite right that the that furlough schemes uh, have been extended um, across across uh, Europe, um, and uh, and obviously um, uh, in 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 the, the, the Republic of Ireland scheme as well. I think it's important, though, when we particularly when we look at some an example like uh, Germany. Germany has the infrastructure for uh, retraining and uh, and reskilling and redeployment uh, of, of, of workers. It has um, there there are plenty of there are actually good and bad examples, but Germany has, has learned from its attempts um, at dealing with uh, maybe um, regional um, regional uh, economic crises due to the closure of coal mines and things and things like that. That they kind of uh, continuing their a furlough scheme or a flexi furlough scheme when you have that kind of reemployment uh, and redeployment um, uh, infrastructure within your within your labour market is, uh, is 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 key. Um, to just extend the furlough scheme, but not to to put in place that kind of more longer term um, uh, infrastructure, I think is 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 a danger of just continuing the furlough scheme uh, on its own because. 
it will it will end uh, eventually and um i think it's 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 kind of uh, it's not it's not fair to 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 keep people um on the idea that they're eventually coming back to to work if uh, if that's not going to be the case once the scheme ends okay um thank you um and i i'm not sure if either of you are familiar with the median term recovery document that the department has published um, I guess I would have some criticism of it and there's a, a lack of clear objectives as to, to what we're going to do um, and the actions that it's going to, going to take um, to achieve those. Um, again, are there examples that, that we can be looking at and you have mentioned some of them there in terms of the, the likes of the, the re-employment um, and the retraining programmes that we need to see um, sectors to, to be focusing on, the um, the experience, I suppose, of lockdown uh, and the, the, ex the sectors that perhaps expanded during, during lockdown um, and as, as we plan for a future where you know, we may face more of this type of thing going forward, but also you know, the kind of more agile, agile and, and flexible working that you know, people want to see. Are there opportunities in this that, that we should be now incorporating into our economic recovery strategy? Well, uh, if, if I could just uh, chip in, uh, in terms of some of the sectors, I suppose what, what, what you're seeing is the one of the key themes about moving, increasing shift to online shopping uh, has, give, given that uh, Northern Ireland ha has been so successful in the cybersecurity space uh, over the last number of the years, and as Paul was talking about the loss of jobs in construction, and then we had some sectors surging. Nobody, my, nobody, well, I, no economists foresaw the kind of growth in uh, cybersecurity that we saw back then. That's a growth sector. Uh, that's a growth sector going forward. Uh, but I suppose so, some of the areas where we need to see activity uh, sort of encouraged and promoted. What where we saw in the likes of the lockdown was what what struck me in particularly was how lack of uh, lack of lack of uh, IT equipment, relatively basic IT equipment in the, the likes of the legal legal sphere, where we had courts had to be closed, where you saw other parts of uh, the UK and other regions they were actually able to use. Uh, Skype for business, all of these kind of functions where the, there was pressure to keep things open, try and keep, because if you keep the courts open in whatever way they can be uh, opened, then you're getting solicitors operating, that sort of money's flowing, barristers, law firms and all of those kind of things. So it's even how, well, this is sort of Department for the Economy is then looking into other departments and how they can ensure you can maximise the operational capacity of the various public services to ensure that all the various activities, whether it's planning, whether uh, whether it's in terms of the courts, that they are uh, maximised. Because in the likes of so social distancing and the health regulations are a problem, but just to give you some examples of what they are doing in the likes of uh, Hong Kong, they would have been requisitioning uh, theatres, cinemas, turning them into courts where they could do social distancing. Uh, you know, we've even got likes of our waterfront convention centre. And, you know, it's almost like looking at things where there's barriers or blockages to operating businesses, business as usual. How can we think and apply, uh, whether it's technology or, as I say, sort of other, other spaces or workplaces which are out of action because of because of COVID at the minute. Thank you. Um, and I guess one of the real challenges, and you both mentioned it, I think, um, is what is facing young people um, in the, the months ahead. Um, that the lack, I suppose, of those jobs that many young people would have taken on while at college, um, those ones, Paul, that you described as, as kind of um, expanding in, in the, the, the last um, recession, the, the service sectors, the, the fact that those aren't going to be there is going to be a, a huge difficulty. Um, and aside from the, the investment that we need to see in skills and, and training for young people, 
Are there other things that we need to be looking at there as well? Yeah, just to say on the on the on the skills bit, um, I think you know we will see a lot of, of younger people um, moving into into to full time education, maybe a greater proportion um, than would have been expected uh, before. That's is, that's absolutely to be to be welcomed, and I hope we we have the capacity within uh, within our current system to be able to to take that in. But I think one of Northern Ireland's key weaknesses with skills has been that sometimes we, in certain parts of the economy, in certain parts of, of the of the system, we can pump out the the skills and we can we can. Uh, we can promote the acquisition uh, of skills by workers. We are less good at getting um, promoting the um, rewarding of skills within uh, within our within companies within our uh, economy. That yes, the supply of skills uh, needs to needs to, to to go up a gear. But unless the demand for skills is there to 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 absorb it, um, we are we are putting people through a. a expensive enough uh, education uh, system and we don't have the economy um, to, to cater for it uh, on, on the other side. So I would think that um, any time or any time a government department takes action on the supply of skills, unless there is a matching um, uh, program to try and boost the demand for skills uh, in the economy, um, we're, 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 not really, uh, we're not really going to gain that much ground. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Sinead? You can't Sinead, hear you, Sinead, you're muted. You're still muted. Still muted, Sinead. You might be muted on both your tablet and the sound for the system. Okay, I've got it now. Got you. Okay. Got you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your very sobering presentations this morning. And I suppose just as an observation, um, I think at, we're at the point here in, in um, the, the life of the executive that we really need to see um, great leadership and we need to have an integrated uh, recovery plan uh, and, and we can't work in silos anymore. And we need to look at just from what Richard has uh, has. Um, said in, in relation to the deficits that we have around um, our skills and innovation uh, and, and our economic policies. We need to make sure that we work collectively together around that. And um, also, I, I suppose, you know, my concern is that we have left a lot of people behind um, with with uh, no support and no help at all, and, um, and 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 we're going to see you know them falling off. And I suppose sometimes we we'll talk about recovery as if we're in recovery at the moment. I think a lot of people are just in survival mode, and um, and you know projecting probably in the next six eight weeks when the furlough scheme um, actually ends, um, we're, we're going to be in dire straits and can you know Richard maybe give any examples um, in how that you know the, we could collectively work to better together in, in terms of a program for government because I don't see any clear priorities been set out uh, we seem to be reacting in, in relation to policy rather than actually driving at the moment. Well, I, su I suppose in, in many ways, what, what, we're, what we're finding now is uh, after the pandemic has struck, we're becoming reminded of what could be termed Northern Ireland's kind of underlying economic health problems, you know, whether it's low productivity, high economic inactivity, the infrastructure deficits that I mentioned before. And yeah, in, in, in many ways, I think it's, if, if you look over the last decade and the recovery from the last recession, I think, in my view, Northern Ireland was uh, and policymakers were too obsessed with corporation tax, and uh, you know, were too focused on things that they couldn't control, that they wanted new levers, whereas we neglected the levers that we do uh, do control, be it infrastructure, be it how you can deliver. Uh, how we could have delivered the A6 sooner, how we could deliver the A5, how we could uh, do the York Street Exchange, how we can end up 
doing our wastewater, all of those kind of things, funding, funding that. We control all those, but those have been neglected over the last 10 years. Same with the skills as well. And we almost have to, uh, I think another problem with Northern Ireland economic strategies, uh, our ability to have long-term plans and stick to them. Mm -hmm. It seems as if we just chop and change from a kind of corporate plan to a strategy, which after it's published and it, it has its day for a couple of years, it's kind of forgotten about. But key kind of metrics such as, for me, if you were waving a magic wand and just fixing two things, it would be sort out the school leavers problem, the low skills, because from that stems so many pro other problems. And then it's sorting out having your uh, long-term funding for infrastructure investment and it's sorting out all the kind of blockages and uh, stumbling blocks that we have for delivery of that. If you sort it out those two things, get the skills and the infrastructure, that will provide the environment in which business was, will thrive, uh, you know, more so than looking to financially support businesses uh, per se. If you get the skills and you get the infrastructure, that creates a better env environment conducive for, for businesses to prosper. Absolutely agree with you totally there. And that probably brings me to a question to Paul as now. Um, Paul, in relation to you, you've done a paper on um, the powers in Northern Ireland, a new fiscal kind of uh, settlement here. Um, in, in relation to that, that investment, which is required for skills, for our infrastructure, etc., have, have you any thoughts on how we find the money to, to make those long-term investments in order to uh, secure the environment uh, for, for, for our future generations? Yeah, I, th I think what I would say in with regard to that is, I mean, my my uh, my issue with with fiscal policy in Northern Ireland is not that we'll that there is a, a a sort of a pot of money that we could find in Northern Ireland that HMRC uh, in in Westminster can't find, but I suppose for from from our point of view it's a it's it's, it's a longer term that um, that because the executive here doesn't have any 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 skin in the game in terms of um, of being exposed to revenues, of being exposed to the health uh, of the Northern Ireland uh, economy, it has never really had the kind of incentives that, um, that national governments have had uh, to tackle the kind of things that, that Richard's been talking about because those kind of uh, those kind of infrastructural investments bring productivity growth. They bring higher value added, um, which eventually um, makes its way into 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 more buoyant uh, uh, revenue revenue streams. And I think that's kind of um, like uh, we we don't we could we couldn't see the kind of um, uh, kind of uh, lock stock uh, um, devolving of, of of fiscal powers to, to Northern Ireland as kind of was proposed around corporation tax, but a more subtle way of of, of bringing um, the executive to a more substantial fiscal role, and it also requires a complete uh, uh, refurb job on how we how we how we how we spend uh, money uh, from uh, coming from uh, the Barnet uh, formula and, and things like that. But I, I think uh, in in terms of in terms of how we how, how the executive uh, would would seek to 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 to, to recover from from covid obviously at this at this moment in time the scale of the of the money and support that's going to be needed in northern ireland is 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 is, is beyond anything that we've we've encountered before and um our, our we really do need to be looking at, at Westminster and lobbying very, very significantly there um, for, uh, for for a more substantial scheme to replace um, uh, furlough, which can ensure that we don't see that kind of uh, rapid um, um, uh, increase in unemployment that was that will come at the end of, uh, of October if the scheme just ends uh, abruptly. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Sinead. Um, Gary? Hello, um, thanks Chair for bringing me in uh, and thanks Richard and Paul for those um, presentations. Obviously it was very useful um, and detailed and, and we welcome that. And we always have to be mindful that when we're dealing with 
um, statistics and figures, whilst we all may be blown away by them, the reality is that you know the, the, these involve actual human beings and families who face the, the prospect of unemployment and, and uh, financial ruin. Uh, so we have to be just mindful of that. Um, I suppose, um, Richard, you touched on uh, when you were giving your presentation around the priorities, and I think that it's fair to say that. The minister has been focused in terms of her number one priority in ensuring that we can get um, the economy open again. Now, she has faced opposition in trying to do that, but we do recognise the fact that when su support measures were vital um, and grants were, were very um, much needed, uh, that's not going to uh, ensure that our economy, uh, economy recovers. That, that just keeps certain businesses afloat, which is obviously important, but it's, it's not going to uh, ensure that we can recover in the long term. Uh, one of the concerns that I do have is around the fact that uh, we do talk about um, technology and working from home, which, which is fantastic in terms of ensuring that people are safe and we can adhere to social distancing measures. The downside of that, of course, is the fact that there's nobody in our town centres or city centres. So whilst our, for example, uh, Richard, you talked about the, the legal services, you know, we, we have seen the, you know, a complete shutdown because the infrastructure doesn't exist to allow for those types of services to proceed. But on the other hand, that if that uh, infrastructure did exist, what well, would help over those past couple of months, going forward, we need to get people back into those uh, courtrooms and back into the city centre because the businesses that are uh, that have survived and are reopened, they're not going to be surviving for much longer because there's nobody coming into them because those office workers aren't there to buy their sandwich or buy their cup of coffee or uh, to go and get their hair done, all of those things. Uh, so I, I just want to hear your views on that in terms of the downside, I suppose, of the technology and the fact that you know we do need to get uh, people back into their uh, places of employment. The second point that I wanted to touch on was around the NISRA figures which were released yesterday. Um, they, they, they talk about the Northern Ireland unemployment rate uh, increased from the quarter to 2.9%. Um, the quarterly change was obviously significant. The Northern Ireland unemployment rate was below the UK rate, which is of, was 4.1%. The Republic of Ireland rate was 5.3%. And the EU 27 rate was 6.7%. I just wanted to get your views on that in terms of other EU countries may have, um, I suppose, an advantage in terms of their te technological capacity. But is there a downside in that in the sense that, you know, we're seeing maybe more traditional employments suffer at the hands of that? Yeah, so I suppose going to your... Uh, First question, just about the downside from working from home. Certainly, it is a major problem with uh, city centres, town centres, where people are working from home. Uh, the the whole kind of sandwich economy has has uh, has nosedived. As uh, I suppose, there are some areas that are benefiting from that. So even in the likes of Belfast, some of the suburbs and uh, outer areas they are kind of bustling and benefiting at the expense of the uh, the other uh, the, the other uh, bars and or cafes and restaurants in the city centre. I suppose what this is doing is accelerating the trend that was already there in terms of the challenges that the high street was facing with people shopping online as, as well as, a, as, a, as another thing. The, the natural sort of response to that would be what we need is more people living in town centres or in the city centres, and that's where you would get the footfall. But for the likes of Belfast and an increasing number of areas around, around Northern Ireland, that's not possible for the simple reason we don't have the wastewater infrastructure. So a lot of the solutions that we would try and deal with some of the problems that are emerging are kind of back are, are linked back to some of those other wider issues such as the the infrastructure deficit and uh, uh, challenging those and I suppose that the challenge even about getting back to the offices getting back to the office is then getting back to the office is one thing but you then have to then adhere to the various uh, restrictions and guidelines which would then limit the capacity of which office 
uh, offices uh, can function. Uh, so that, that is a challenge, but as I said before, that's also an opportunity working from home. If you're less focused on a particular place, particularly if you're in the Northwest, you then have the potential to uh, work, take, take a job which is notionally based in, in Belfast or further afield, but actually perform that uh, further at home or, or closer, closer to home. Uh, and sorry, your second question about them with the NISR figures and then technological capacity of other countries. Uh, was that just their ability? How successful are they to... Yes, uh, I suppose my point being is that the unemployment rate uh, is higher in other areas. And, 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 and what, what the point that I'm trying to make is that their shift to, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether it be financial services or those other sectors that maybe don't involve, um, you know, being in a physical premises. That's my point. It's just that, you know, what is the reason for that? What is the reason? Yeah, I, su I suppose, again, that this is an opportunity for Northern Ireland in terms of how it can take jobs uh, from elsewhere when they are looking to sort of offshore some of the jobs where we've seen some of the employment growth from the uh, in in recent years, the kind of Fintrues, the uh, all states, the uh, uh, lo a lot of the legal, uh, Herbert Smith and Alan and Overy and all of those sort of things, where... The attractiveness of Northern Ireland uh, as a as a relatively low cost of living, ability to buy a house, all of those kind of things, uh, then you get the increasing push from companies who are going to be cut, cutting costs and looking at off, uh, offshoring and outsourcing. That's uh, a great opportunity for for Northern Ireland for 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 new jobs, etc. But that's where you need the telecoms infrastructure. That's what is going to be where you've got your sort of competitive edge. If you if you have the the right infrastructure, suitable speeds, etc., you are able to then uh, become an attractive proposition to try and shift more of those jobs out of those uh, other higher cost regions uh, to to Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, John Stewart. Go ahead, John. John, John, I think you're still muted. But we can't see you. There we it. go. There we go. Matt, have you got me now? Yeah. Hey, you, yeah, still no picture. Yeah. Apologies, Richard, Paul, you can't see me, but hopefully you can hear me, okay? Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, as has been said, these are some very stark figures. Um, probably what we expected to hear, um, and given what, what we've gone through over the last six to seven months. Um, but as, as Gary has said, these are these are people, and um, we have to be aware of that. In terms of um, a number of things, um, you've talked about investment in, um, in our infrastructure here, Richard, and how important that was. And I think we're coming to see just how um, the impact of a lack of investment here over time, particularly in our roads and in our, um, our utilities, particularly water as well, when it comes to our town centres. Um, uh, and I, I totally agree with you on that point. Um, one of the, the, the areas we've been discussing in the last um, few weeks is our SMEs and how important they are to um, the backbone of the economy in Northern Ireland um, and the particular lack of support that they've received here. I'm just conscious to get your feelings for how important um, the SME sector is in Northern Ireland and, 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 and what you think we could be doing more to prop them up, especially given what you said Richard, about the amount of debt that a lot of them have taken on and the impact that's going to have um, in the coming months and years. Yes, uh, thank you, John. Yes, couldn't agree more on the SMEs, the importance of SMEs. It's uh, Northern Ireland with an SME economy. I suppose what we, what I think we will see with the, the likes of Invest Northern Ireland is I think we will see a greater shift towards it be, becoming more focused on SMEs and less focused on uh, some of the larger, uh, some of the larger firms, because given the economic environment we're in, 
and this kind of like new era, it is going to be the case where uh, financial support is going to have to reach, it essentially is going to have to increase its client base, it's going to have to reach more clients and be more focused on targeted initiatives, such as some of the ones which were announced in uh, recent days and weeks, such as the, the kind of digital uh, uh, adaption sort of funds and things for that. But I would foresee that where Invest NI is going to channel its funds will be more into support and programs for the SME base and less on financial support on some of the things that we've seen over the years where the big kind of 10 million plus assistance for firms uh, sometimes on a, on a repeated basis. I think that kind of era has passed and will be more in terms of what you can actually do uh, to the, the smaller firms. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I thought you talked about the importance of um, the furlough scheme, and I think we're, we're all in agreement on that. We had, there was an emotion passed in the Assembly last week calling on the Chancellor um, to extend that scheme because we don't want to see the cliff edge that you referred to. Um, obviously, that's that's not in our gift to extend it, and we can only continue to call for it. If you were if you were who's in charge of um, the Department of Economy and you were looking at and the executive in terms of an economic recovery strategy, what key schemes and additional skills you talked about would you like to see or would you want to implement uh, in order to see um, a, a quick and, and uh, economic recovery here? I think uh, in terms of the in terms of the, the furlough scheme, I think you know even if say if we were a couple of weeks back and we were looking um, at the furlough scheme ending in October, we may have had the time to be actually able to put in place a a, a replacement um, for it. The flexi furlough, I think, could continue in its in its in its current form, and there's definitely an argument um, for that in terms of helping companies who maybe aren't back at full uh, level operation. And in other countries, it's referred to as a short time work scheme, and it's a permanent feature uh, of, 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 of labor markets there. Um, Germany operates a, a very successful one, and it's built in there in, in terms of it's there beforehand. And so companies, when a shock happens, can, can, can make uh, use of it. I think in terms of, of what Northern Ireland's uh, 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 the Northern Ireland executive uh, uh, could do if the furlough scheme was uh, was was going to be extended is to look for it to be joined together with a re a reemployment or uh, a, a re retraining uh, a scheme. I suppose my main worry with just the blanket extension of the furlough scheme is that we'll end up in March in the same situation uh, as what we're going to end up in October with just slightly fewer uh, people. There are going to be um, the furrow scheme will have to end whether that happens gradually or it happens starkly in October or starkly uh, in, in March. Um, it's the idea that nothing has changed in the economy and therefore people coming out the other end of furlough aren't going to require any further assistance to get back into the, to the labour market. The ground has shifted. We can't lift people up from where they were and place them back down uh, exactly uh, where they were again. Some people are going to are going to find that what was what they left is no longer um, is no longer there, and there is an onus on government uh, to intervene there because, to be quite blunt about it, government is the one that shifted the ground. We have put in place the restrictions, and look, we've done it for the best of of reasons. But uh, but government is responsible um, uh, for the uh, for, for the for the economic uh, uh, hardship that's going to that's going to transpire from that for lots of workers. Okay, thank you. Just one very final point, and that's on the housing market. I think um, it surprised a lot of people that we haven't seen a decline in the housing market, and perhaps that's because of the um, scheme induced by the government around the, um, the tax and things. And um, but I'm just wondering with potential with the rising unemployment and the impacts here on the economy, what are you predicting for the housing market here in Northern Ireland in terms of sales and, and valuation of houses? Well, uh, I think I'll take that one. In terms of what we, ha what we have seen is the housing market was shut down for a period of time during the lockdown, so sales could not take place. Uh, what has surprised me in the housing market is then the fact that the, the number of people who hadn't thought of moving uh, then through their experience of lockdown then were deciding that they did want to move. So you're, you're, 
what what you are seeing is uh, as Paul kind of described is there's an element of sh a sugar rush going on where mm -hmm. you've had closure now it's reopened people are now surging to buy and you hear about sort of uh, highest sales or figures in five years or something like that whether that's referring to August but as I said in the beginning sales up until July were half of what they were last year I expect you know this year they're going to be half for the end of the year they'll be about half so transactions are going to be small what we're also seeing is uh, maximum loan to value ratios have fallen way back uh, from 95% to 80, 85 for first time buyers. First time buyers drive the housing market. Many yeah. of them are now going to have to look at the likes of co ownership instead. And we've seen demand for co ownership treble. Uh, so I think the housing market, in, in terms of transactions, the housing market will have more of a hangover next year than what it currently has. It isn't immune from what's happening in the rest of the economy. And you bear in mind, buying a house is the biggest uh, discretionary expenditure item that uh, that you would buy as a, as a consumer. Consumer confidence will be impacted by uh, unemployment, job losses, all of those sort of effects. It's almost at the minute the housing market seems to be the last dog to bark. Uh, we've had the, the labour markets already started to go, but the housing market seems to have held up well. What we've also seen in the housing market is uh, e even uh, there's fewer houses being built, so supply is being reduced. That uh, on, on its own uh, will help to uh, prop up prices, but uh, mortgage volumes, etc., for this year and next year are going to be well down on uh, what they were uh, last year. Thank you for that, Richard. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, John Adair. Uh, thank you to Richard and, and Paul. A very interesting, if not al alarming, presentation from you both. Um, it's interesting in terms of how economic strategies to and fro, and Richard, you had mentioned the concentration on corporation tax. I recall a time when <coughs> excuse me, public sector workers were deemed as a drain on the economy and now we're being told that we need public sector workers back into our city centres to buy sandwiches and coffee to save the economy. So it's interesting how these things go back and forth. But uh, I want to ask a question in relation to, to Brexit because the economic discussions we're having here, and it was interesting Richard you had said, I'm not saying putting words in your mouth, but in 2019 we were going into recession, or we were in recession. Uh, and by 20, you think by 2024 we will return to 2019 conditions around that, which in fairness isn't great. We, we want to be progressing. But I want to ask you, what impact will it have on our economy if we have a no deal, a no trade deal with the EU? Uh, no trade deal, uh, no deal, trade deal with the EU. That's uh, it's going to be devastating for Northern Ireland economy, uh, more so for the UK economy. Uh, but it's it's just it's just bad news all round. The what we've already seen is the kind of Brexit uncertainty uh, over the last number of years has seen. A lack of investment by businesses and on the run-up to this we just have with a no deal uh, a no deal just then heaps more uncertainty on an already very uncertain and financially fragile uh, world and businesses just do not have the bandwidth to deal when, when they're trying to make their business work and try and battle to stay uh, they're in survival mode just layering more uncertainty with a no-deal Brexit is just going to set, it'll put some businesses under and it'll just make, uh, it'll cause disruption for, for the economy as a whole. And my view is that Brexit, even if it's not a no-deal, it's the, the ongoing uh, uncertainty and changes with Brexit will act as a dampener on growth uh, for the Northern Ireland economy next year and beyond. And have you factored that into your prediction that it'll be 2024, even say there is a deal, uh, that you're into your prediction that it'll be 2024 for our economy returns to, say, 2019 standards? 
not if it's uh, not if it's no deal. Mm. Okay. My, I was just, uh, mine's on the basis that there kind of would be a, uh, a deal, but with a lot of these forecasts, given the extremes of what we have seen and the and, and the sort of uh, falls that we have seen, that's you know that that is a sort of like broad uh, broad projection, but uh, certainly throwing a no deal into it would just uh, uh, be a, a fly in the ointment, uh, to put it mildly. Okay, and, and Paul, uh, maybe you want to comment on, on those qu that question as well, but I also want to ask you about your comment, and uh, again, I'll put words into your mouth, but the stage we're at now is about protecting workers, uh, and you mentioned uh, the, the weak social security system we have, uh, and in terms of how that would act as a, a protection if it was a, if we had a good social security system in terms of there was in the absence of furlough, etc. But can I also ask in terms of what uh, this is a short, medium to long term project, uh, as many economic predictions are. But in your view, what should we do now? Because in my mind, it's about holding on to what we have. And you, your phrase was protecting workers. What do we do now to protect workers? I, yeah, I think um, I think the, well, the first thing is that we, 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 we need to protect their, 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 their incomes. And when I say, you know, that furlough can end, I think the support to workers has to remain, but that we go from the emphasis on supporting workers until they can get back into their original jobs to supporting workers until we can, the state can get them back into it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean state putting them into to, to public sector jobs. But that we have to, we have to, we have to recognise an obligation um, uh, to workers for whom the economic activity in which they worked has been removed uh, uh, from the uh, from the economy and is not likely to return uh, in any stable uh, form um, in the near future. That it's it it, it 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 goes from it goes from preserving their relationship with their employer, which is what furlough was was all about. To, to assuming um, uh, the the uh, responsibility um, for getting them them, them back into to work, and I, I see a direct connection between that and the infrastructural uh, deficits that have been uh, outlined uh, here today. They were necessary before this in terms of uh, the, the proper functioning of the Northern Ireland uh, economy. They're necessary now because we're going to have a large section of the labour. Uh, force which isn't going to be able to to find uh, employment uh, readily and um it's not a it's just not a new concept it's as, it's as old as john maynard keynes but um that that we 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 have the we have the infrastructural deficits and we're going to have a, um, a section of the labor force is going to require a, a, a new employment and we just have to we just have to to, to bring those uh, those two strands together Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for that. Uh, and I could just pick up on John's point there about the impact of Brexit. Um, I think there's an analysis by London School of Economics that shows that while all businesses are negatively impacted by COVID and will be negatively impacted by Brexit, those worst impacted by COVID are different from those that are most likely to be badly hit by Brexit. So. We're, we're getting a real double whammy there in terms of the negative economic outlook if there's a, a no deal. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Great. Yes. Yes. All right. Thanks. Um, okay, moving on then. Claire? Yeah, there yeah, we go. Yeah. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the presentations. Um, a lot of other members have co covered some of the points that I was hoping to ask. Excuse me. Um, I, I want to pick up, uh, Richard, I think it was you who had made a point in around the city deals and I suppose the growth deals, which, which sort of complement those um, city deals. Is there a suggestion now that in the new context in which we're operating, those are potentially risky and, uh, and maybe it's something we shouldn't be pursuing if there is a, if there is a chance that maybe we, we won't be able to fulfil um, the aims from those uh, projects? Um, the other thing that you had uh, mentioned as well, which I thought was quite interesting, was about the, the pipeline in terms of the skills on the line, um, particularly with those school children who maybe have uh, uh, missed the, their education. 
my assumption, and maybe wrongly, would, would have been that school children are, are are quite resilient. They're like sponges. They would have been able to pick that up again. Um, so I am interested to, to hear your points in and around that. And, and I suppose even on the point of skills, um, is there opportunities in this new kind of space which which we have to work that we could be promoting different types of skills, maybe more virtual type skills? Um, you know, I think John made the point in the chamber yesterday around the technology sector, how it is probably one of the areas that's doing quite well. Is that something that then we should be looking towards in terms of uh, trying to promote the uh, industries that actually will have jobs at the end of it, insofar as our skills, um, you know, should further and higher education be be creating almost those skill academies that we used to have that, that, that looked at um, actually providing what employers and industry needs rather than just, um, uh, I, I suppose, um, uh, turning out to qualifications that are really difficult to get jobs within. Um, also, the interesting point, I think you've already covered that in response to John Stewart's uh, questions. I, 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 I wasn't surprised to hear that car sales and property seem to um, increase during lockdown. And, and I take your point around um, that bottleneck then being released um, again in August. But I, I wonder again, is there opportunities with that? Or are we leading ourselves? a difficult path because those types of sales um, do come with commitment, financial commitment. And is there is there almost um, are we setting ourselves up for a fall in that respect when when people are buying these things and maybe the the uh, employment and economy is going to be vulnerable in the in the months and years ahead? So sorry, there was a few things there. Yeah. So I suppose j just on the issue of city deals, if it was the likes of the the Belfast one, you've got you've got and linking into kind of like Belfast uh, sort of greater plan. You know, when there's talk about bringing the likes of 60,000 people in to increase the number of people living there by 60,000, you cannot, you're not going to be able to do that unless you address the water infrastructure. Because at the minute they're, they're saying that you cannot have any additional uh, demands placed on some of the areas in Belfast. And indeed, there's uh, numerous towns around the, uh, around the country or like that. So it's more, the risk is just, well... You, you cannot deliver the plan, and, and it's. I suppose, I think this is a kind of symptom of what we have in Northern Ireland, where invariably we're after getting the money, and it's almost getting the money and getting the funding is almost the kind of job done. Whereas mm. that, it's actually only that's the that's the beginning of it, mm -hmm. and actually being able to deliver on that. So it's just wastewater infrastructure is going to impact on. The, the city sort of deals in some shape or form. Uh, I'm just not aware of the exact detail, but that it, it it's kind of a fallback position. Yeah. When you're saying about the the pipeline sco schools and children being resilient, etc., uh, they are. But if you think even before this, we were churning out school leavers higher proportion with no skills and qualifications whatsoever. You've had the disruption. What what you've had is. The, the normal kind of variation that you would have in a class in terms of ability and performance, you would that is going to have widened considerably. Indeed, mm -hmm. there's been research from, I think it's the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which was talking about uh, the uh, you will see some of the most deprived uh, children will be about 18 months behind mm -hmm. their peers come the age of 16. I think we're going to see a surge in this, given what we've already experienced. You're going to see a surge in uh, underperformance and this widening in uh, educational uh, standards, because what you would have seen is, you know, I'm aware of a lot of children just simply kind of going off the grid, as it were, in, in, in the lockdown. And if I was a teacher trying to teach now in a class, you're going to find that the abilities are going to have just dispersed over you know the the range where uh, you're actually having to cope with and teach now so mm -hmm. it's almost how do you do that and in, in england yeah. they're doing catch up and things and how do you, how do you get in, into that i'm also thinking northern ireland always has an oversupply of uh, graduate teachers is there something that we can leverage in and get people in again this is, serves two functions catching up on the lost education and targeting particularly the most disadvantaged and getting uh, graduate teachers uh, in a gainful employment 
mm. or even if it's getting teachers out of retirement to, to do all this, I think it is important to do that. Your issue on virtual skills and all of those kind of things, yes, it's it's all something uh, to look at and the kind of skills and that children are doing at schools now compared to what I did back in my day or <laughs> or uh, night and day difference. Uh, but uh, all of those kind of skills, uh, coding, uh, those kind of things, very important. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I really do take your point. Um, in relation to skilled ch children, and you know, I, 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 my comments around COVID would be that it's probably already deepening the cracks that already exist, um, and and I think it's concerning because we, we needed to tackle that before COVID, and if anything, now we need to provide a focus there. Um, I suppose I was thinking of it around maybe younger children, um, and then that pipeline, but there's there's issues in, in and around that age group as well. But I suppose if, if we as a committee were looking at this from an economy perspective and an in a higher education perspective, is there more that we could be doing around the, the needs group um, to, to ensure that we don't, you know, lose sight of those individuals because that's already a challenge. And um, you know, I, I really do think you make a, a valid point in, in respect of that. So it's something that I would be keen to to go back to the department with because um, you know, it's one of those things that if we don't put a focus on it, then it's too late, you know, further it's, down the line. I think it's also worth pointing out is those group of disadvantaged school children and that kind of cohort, nobody is going to come to represent them or come up to Stormont yeah. and ask for a package. You know, all other kind of uh, interests do have that. They don't have that luxury. Yeah, and we have a responsibility there for for their aspirations as much as you know what how that impacts on the economy. So I, I really do appreciate you you making that point, and I think it's one that I certainly, as a member of this committee, would like to pursue. Um, to come back to the the growth deal, yeah, I, I find those comments really interesting because you're not the first to say them to me. I think when we when we got that over the line, and you know everybody was celebrating that and the money, and it was all of that. People forgot that it has to be, you know, for it to be truly successful, it needs to be a strategy which can be fulfilled and completed and come to a conclusion. And I think there maybe does need to be that reflection um, moving forward so that we can make the most of these opportunities and make the most of the, those money. But again, it comes back to points that, you know, I think Sinead had made around, you know, cross-departmental working and trying to recognise, you know, how, how we make the most of that. And that's strategy, that's good governance, you know, but I, you know, I bang on about that a lot. Um, but no, look, thank you. I appreciate that. It was a really interesting presentation. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, like Claire, I probably would suggest that, that most of the, the questions that I would like to ask have already been asked. But um, following what I think can be reasonably described as a uh, thoroughly depressing uh, comment this morning, what, if any, opportunities do you see for us uh, in terms of the, the future of the economy? I know you've set out uh, the the sort of the big ticket issues with regards to infrastructure and education, the things we need to do um, to, to step up and to prepare for the next number of years that get us to 24, 25, and and hopefully we we uh, put in place um, processes and procedures that will allow business to build and the economy to rebuild over that period of time. But are there any opportunities now that we should be taking advantage of, um, even um, uh, even in the in the teeth of of, of where we are in relation to this uh, pandemic? Um, in in addition to that, I, I think people will have been very struck by. Um, your comments around uh, how uh, the, the lack of IT uh, has actually hit in terms of even, for example, the public sector's ability to do its job. I was at a meeting in the Department of the Economy, it was actually in Netherly last week, uh, and walked past the three floors of empty office blocks and I was getting out of the car, I was glancing through the windows and all you could see was uh, serried rows of, of uh, desktop computers. Um, I, I doubt that the, the, the Department of the Economy has substituted those with laptops for people at home. People are, people are, 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 are using heath runs and connections to actually do their business uh, from home um, and we have a... We, you know, we have government departments that need to step up, let alone the, the, the private sector that needs to step up in terms of, of IT. Um, reference was made, I think Paul made reference to um, 
what replaces furlough and is that more down the line of supporting workers rather than supporting business? I'd like him to expand a little more on what actually supporting workers would look like or what he sees uh, supporting workers looks like and, and how uh, that would fit into uh, the priorities of the Department of the Economy because it's just difficult to see at this point in time um, a, a, a Department of the Economy which is which is it claims to be business focused uh, and I see little evidence of it actually being employee or worker focused for the future uh, and maybe um, slightly tongue in cheek do you really see a minister that seems fix fixated with a ham sandwich economy actually calling the mustard um, uh, I suppose I could I could uh, I could take that up there there I th I think the um, I think, I think the the point about about moving from supporting, and it's not about it's not about saying you know it's it's a it's a mind shift in terms of uh, from supporting jobs to supporting um, uh, workers because I think in in many of these instances we're going to see firms that will survive but will survive in a different form and quite possibly with just not the kind of staffing levels that they had uh, previously had. In certain circumstances, I think you'll find that lockdown has had the effect on a few businesses of maybe pushing them towards um, technology uh, or automation, which they hadn't uh, considered um, before because they hadn't had the incentive uh, toward doing it. But many businesses have had to find much more innovative ways of, of, of carrying out their, their trade and unfortunately, in that circumstance, it's just not uh, it's just not no longer uh, uh, viable for them um, to bring to bring to bring workers back. That's, if anything, an effect of of, of, of COVID pushing something that maybe would have organically um, uh, occurred um, further on. So I, it's not sort of saying that we, we we stop supporting businesses and we start supporting workers, but it's the idea that we're not supporting a worker to remain as they were before the the crisis that we have to equip um, that worker who's going to be going back to seek new work uh, we have to equip them um, with the with the with the skills and the resources uh, that they're going to need um, uh, to, to, to regain um, employment I think being paid during and that if we if we reimagine what post furlough is going to look like. It should be a very flexible scheme that includes people perhaps going part time back to employment and the rest of the time should be retraining new skills, FE. Yes. And I, I think as well, I mean, because I, I think I, I think uh, training as a sort of a, a, as a full time kind of uh, uh, we, we say putting people into training, coupling training with uh, existing work uh, in many cases could could uh, could save jobs by 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 upskilling uh, workers with within firms. And you talked about opportunities. You know, uh, it's a fairly bleak uh, uh, vista that we're, we're 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 staring down at here. But if there is one benefit that we could get out uh, of this entire crisis is that many of the jobs that will have been destroyed will have been lower value added, lower paid jobs that weren't very good for uh, the people that worked in them. And that if we can move towards an economy where we focus more on job quality rather than just job quantity, um, we may have been actually able to, to garner something um, uh, better um, at the other end of, the, of this crisis. Thank you. Rich, just to just add in on some of the opportunities, I suppose it's, uh, it's building building on cybersecurity where Northern Ireland has the, uh, uh, what is it, the highest concentration, Belfast is the highest concentration of cybersecurity jobs in Europe. Given what's happening, the move towards online is only going to continue. Online cybersecurity, and we've had the whole Huawei uh, uh, issue as well. That is just a, a massive growth sector uh, going forward. So it's how do we uh, build on that? Not just then cybersecurity, but kind of wider ICT as well. Uh, and it's also er areas such as healthcare and, and pharma as well, because one of the things that we've seen is this that this has been a health health emergency. Uh, you're likely to see more emphasis on. 
uh, on restructuring aspects of the NHS and uh, focus on sort of vaccines and, and just the whole uh, pharmaceutical space. Also, there could be opportunities with, uh, in terms of global supply chains, are being kind of de-risked and changed because of if overexposed to China. That's already happening, and that could present opportunities where, in, where they're talking about uh, firms are having, they're not maybe totally leaving China, but it's the idea of having a, uh, maybe a China plus, plus one, an alternative uh, supplier, and that could be for some of our manufacturers. You ca could see that you're seeing maybe more, uh, dare I say, Euro European sort of markets uh, being set up on, on, on which we could link into. And uh, as I said, there's the whole, the kind of working from home, outsourcing our ability now with technology before the idea of uh, taking a job in London and doing it remotely, uh, you wasn't really a, a sort of viable option. You would have at least had to have spent some sort of time flying over commuting or whatever. Whereas those, it's, it's now the kind of working from home era has opened up that possibility and it's how do you turn that into even what about even public sector in terms of how does it see can help reduce uh, congestion in towns and cities if people are are able to avail of that whether you have you look at your some of the, some of the uh, property that you have and whether you go for uh, more regional hubs as opposed to a sort of like central location where people then can come in and and, and work there and i suppose what we did see with Northern Ireland was we had a, a shortage of grade A office space for, for FDI. And given what is maybe going to, you're going to see the change in commercial property, uh, what's going to happen there, you could well see that there's grade A office space actually freed up uh, and our lack of grade A office space will not be as limiting factor as it, as it was previously. And just finally, I would also then just say about when we're talking about job losses and businesses failing, don't underestimate how that can actually be a positive. Because when you think of uh, back in the early 2000s when Nortel uh, uh, failed as a, as a business and it was a huge employer and it was seen to be devastating at the time, uh, scores of people who were employed in that company ended up going in, starting their own businesses, working in other companies, and they're now responsible for the kind of flourishing IT and even in terms of the cybersecurity sector that we see today. So I think what that means is then think of in terms of for next year, how important it is with the whole idea of business start programs for people who are coming out from changing jobs, that there could be uh, opportunities uh, if the support is given probably next year rather than not now given all the noise that is going on at the minute uh, that's worth thinking about but there is an area of people at the moment that they describe themselves as excluded from current schemes uh, these are the small new up-and-coming micro businesses and they're not being supported at the moment um, I would hate us to see that we would jump ahead and start to support those types of businesses in the future, but leave behind those that are struggling now. Yeah, one one of the one of the reasons why some of those businesses uh, haven't been supported or is because they some of them are bank outside some of the main banks. So and it's they're unable to get the business bounce back loans, which are only available. That support is only available for the main banks who subscribe to the the scheme. You, you, you made reference in your, your talk, Richard, earlier on about the level of insolvency that was likely to be coming down the line. You didn't actually say what that level would be. Could you just very briefly answer that for us? Well, not, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be any more sort of scientific just about in terms of it, it will, it will uh, surge because what you're seeing is while we're talk, talking about the likes of furlough, uh, the furlough period expiring, there's been a number of inter interventions which have created this kind of calm uh, where we're in the eye of the storm where things don't look too bad at present. But, you know, it's deferral of VAT. It's uh, you ca cannot be uh, evicted from your tenancy 
all of those kind of things. So once they wear off and ex expire, and assuming they're not renewed, you're just going to see that uh, then start to start to surge. But uh, yeah, I, 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 sorry, I can't be more scientific than that. I, what I, what I would say though is what we in the bank are sort of seeing at the minute is at this stage the levels of stress are kind of what is what we're seeing is what we would see in business as usual so that kind of wave has not yet hit but because we've got things such as the furlough scheme and all of those other mitigations already in place and the kind of business the emergency loans etc that is something which is is probably going to be more apparent in 2021 than uh, in 2020. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Oh. Is it just us? No, hang on. Something's gone horribly wrong there. Can you still hear us? No? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. We, yeah. We, 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 I think we're just internal now. <clears throat> they can still hear us. Yeah. I know, but that we, we can get that through the, the main system. Just let me... Okay, so I'm having some technical difficulties here. Can I ask a quick question while you sort of your yeah, go ahead. Uh, Richard and Paul. We've talked about infrastructure in around Belfast, uh, Yorkgate, etc. But one of the infrastructural issues in the new decade, new approach, is the high-speed link between Belfast and Dublin. Um, and, I, and I look at that from a, all politics is local, so I have a constituency interest in this. Uh, for far too long, I think that that link has been seen as, as attracting business into Belfast or business into Dublin. But the, the, the issue around high-quality office space, uh, it, what, what attracts my attention to this, we, we could have workers from Dublin, Drogheda, and uh, Dundalk, sitting in Newry, Portadown, Lurgan, or Belfast within an hour. So I think that there needs to be a, a, a focus or, or certainly a development of a discussion as to how we attract office workers and investment from areas which have now very, very high costs when you look at the cost of Dublin, Drogheda, and Dundalk across the border into New York and constituencies such as mine. Is that a viable prospect? Couldn't, couldn't agree more with that. And because if you think back, what we want is for Northern Ireland to be an attractive place to live, work and visit. And whether it's you're getting people who are actually uh, choosing to work in Dublin or south of, south of the border and live in Northern Ireland, all of that, you know, they contribute to the economy, uh, spending, consumer spending, all of those sort of things. So, yes, I just see that as being kind of an untapped uh, resource uh, that we uh, we should be sort of more proactive in, in trying to go after. Because particularly when you see then for young people, as young people in particular, the cost of rents in Dublin and things like that are so prohibitive. I think you would be... Uh, you know, pushing on an open door there where people would be, it, it, it just has to ch change the focus. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. It appears we are still broadcasting, we so uh, we're, we're, we're kind of okay. Um, look, thank you both very much. It has been really um, useful and there's a lot of takeaways. I think in particular for me, the the takeaway around the, the replacement of the furlough scheme and how we can kind of support workers through a hybrid model of wage subsidy and, and training support. I think that's something that we'll want to pick up on further. So look, thank you both very much for your time this morning. Yes. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Just bring Katie in. Um, can Should we bring welcome. Katie Hayward into the um, spotlight, please? Uh, there we go. Um, so we're moving on then to item number five, which is our briefing from um, Professor Katie Hayward on the UK Internal Market Bill. Um, Katie, first of all, apologies for keeping you waiting. Um, members, there's a, a clerk's memo at page 75. The UK Internal Market Bill is at page 81. Explanatory notes at page 135. The Bill's Impact Assessment, page 175. A memo from Bez at page 221. Um, a Welsh Parliament research paper at page 235, a paper from the Economic Social um, Research Institute, 
on NI inputs to the um, ROI U EU FTA exports at page 275. Um, response from the Department on scrutiny points raised in a Assembly research paper on page 310. Um, a House of Commons Library briefing paper on the internal market bill at page 3 of your table papers and um, the UK government's legal position on the UK internal market bill and NI protocol at page 78 of your table papers. So obviously that bill was introduced last Wednesday to the House of Commons and it passed its second reading and has now progressed to committee stage. Um, the, the clerk has written to the department to seek information on the minister's intentions in terms of um, an LCM. Um, Katie, welcome to our meeting. And um, first of all, I'd like to con congratulate you on your, your recent chairship. Um, I think that's well deserved. Um, if I hand over to you um, just to make an opening statement and then we'll, we'll open it up for, for some questions. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, it's an honour to appear before the committee. Um, I just propose you've, you've had a lot of reading there. So I just propose to give an outline of where this comes from, I guess. Um, the key points in the bill, both relating to devolution and, um, of course, relating to the protocol, and then just a small conclusion about what, what it all might mean. Um, so in terms of the context, it's worth bearing in mind, I guess, the model of the EU single market and a couple of principles in that and um, how it might uh, give us an idea of some of the concerns that have been raised about the UK's approach to the internal market, as we see in this bill. Um, and also some of the logic behind it. So I guess the principle behind any legislation relating to single markets, internal markets, is that where you have legislative differences and autonomy in, uh, in uh, making regulations, it can produce barriers to trade and it can distort competition. Uh, within the EU single market, we saw um, two approaches to managing that, that challenge. One is that of so-called negative integration. So you're basically removing barriers to trade um, in order to, in principle, allow goods to be sold across the UK and services, free movement of services, et cetera. And then there's a positive approach, if you like, which is harmonizing rules. So you see harmonized standards in relation to toy safety chemicals, et cetera. Um, we're very familiar with this because a lot of that has, of course, come through in the, in the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and the development of the EU model has been including um, measures of governance and justification for exemptions um, um, and the legal um, regime, which um, enables the single market to function. It's highly developed. And as we, as we know, there have been um, concerns about it as, as well as um, those who are advocating it. Now, um, when Brexit comes along, we have a situation in which the 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 um, devolved competences, which allow distinct legislative activities within the UK, can potentially give rise to barriers to trade um, with, within the United Kingdom. Um, so it was the application of those common rules of the EU that allowed um, devolution to function as it did. Outside of those, we have a potential problem. And this was identified early on in the Brexit process. Um, analysis conducted by the Cabinet Office over time, but confirmed in 2019, talked about there being around 160 areas where you could have, um, where you had the EU essentially legislating or giving directives in certain areas that, that uh, devolved um, legislators were responsible for. Um, and these could um, therefore potentially give rise to difficulties. So there were three main approaches to that. One was to identify areas where you didn't really need to do anything other than adhere to general common principles. Um, and so no change was needed, such as maximum driver hours. There are almost 80 policy areas where it was considered there were needs to be non-legislative um, common framework agreements. Um, so again, essentially things like memorandums of understanding, working together across the um, devolved uh, legislators to agree those in principle. Um, and uh, it's notable that in some of those areas, we have uh, the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol with competence, including such thing as waste management. And then in around 21 areas, it was seen as necessary to have legislation. And this is where we have the common frameworks. Um, this was to ensure commonality. And the idea was that you'd have the devolved legislatives 
legislatures working together on this to agree the minimum and the maximum, if you like, standards um, in those areas. Um, 21 of these related to Northern Ireland, 17 of them are covered by the protocol, such as GMOs, um, issue relating to the sale of medicines, animal welfare, etc. Um, this was the way in which we presumed that the um, pressures on the UK internal market was, were going to be dealt with through common framework. It was becoming clear that it, the, the time frame was very tight and that these wouldn't be uh, produced in time for the end of the transition period. And there were rumours in uh, late spring, early summer that there was some plan for UK wide legislation um, to address this fundamental issue about the UK internal market. The white paper was produced in July, um, defining the UK internal market rather vaguely as a total set of trading relationships existing across the UK. It had three main elements. One was a market access commitment. One was the idea of having potentially a monitoring authority and then a UK wide subsidy regime. Um, and uh, we know that there was alarm expressed from Scotland and Wales in particular in relation to these. Um, it's worth noting in that white paper that on the protocol, when it came to that, it said, uh, and I quote um, paragraph 29, the government's aim is to ensure this legislative underpinning operates on a full UK wide basis, taking into account the obligations that apply under the Northern Ireland protocol. Um, it explicitly said that the white paper doesn't set out the government's approach to implementing the protocol. It referred then to the command paper issued in May or on delivering unfettered access. Um, and it noted that the that Northern Ireland will continue to apply a subset of EU rules um, and goods being placed on the for sale in Northern Ireland will have to comply with those EU rules. So the consequence of that is that goods entering Northern Ireland, including from Great Britain, um, uh, will be will uh, face some restrictions in that regard. They have to meet those EU standards. Um, so when it came to the bill, uh, it was much more comprehensive than had been anticipated. So yes, it includes uh, market access commitments. Uh, these are broadly um, interpreted. I'll mention that in a minute. It covers services as well. It covers mutual recognition of qualifications. Um, it has um, new roles for the Competition and Markets Authority, um, new functions in that regard. And it also um, it gives the uh, UK government um, um, regulatory powers over the use of subsidies, including being able to um, prevent the use of subsidies if it's seen as distorting uh, the UK internal market. Fundamentally, and uh, um, one thing that makes this bill quite different to what was anticipated and um, um, noted in the uh, white paper, is that it's essentially trying to legislate for unfettered access from Northern Ireland into Great Britain, thus meeting the commitment made in the New Decade New Approach document, as well as elsewhere. So fundamentally, uh, just to explain the, the two key principles, the, the, the principles behind market access commitment that of mutual recognition and non-discrimination. These are given direct legal effect, or will be uh, if this bill is passed. Um, and they're really about new regulations or about amendments to existing ones rather than those that exist already. That's not too surprising because of course, uh, we don't have any uh, problematic divergence to a great degree at the moment. Uh, so mutual recognition is basically saying that if a good is sold in one part of the territory, um, or indeed a service offered in one part of the territory, it should be uh, legally provided in the other. Um, this will apply to rules governing uh, product requirements, such as ingredients, packaging. Um, uh, it also allows for Northern Ireland's interest. It means that qualifying goods from Northern Ireland, and we have yet to see what that actually means, it's likely to be different, according to different goods, that they will be um, able to be sold uh, in Great Britain. A consequence of this is that it significantly limits the ability of the different parts of the UK, uh, namely Scotland and Wales, to enforce their own economic and social uh, preferences. Then the principle of non-discrimination, um, either direct or indiscrimination, uh, based on differential treatment between local and incoming goods. Um, and this is prohibited um, by this bill. And essentially, um, an upshot of all of this is that the uh, th this might effectively render the 
autonomous decisions of the devolved um, legislatures um, redundant in practice because of the um, um, overwhelming size of the um, English market um, compared to elsewhere in the UK. So a key concern is what this bill lacks. It lacks safeguards, um, the definition of the scope of the rules um, and the range of justifications for exemptions is actually quite um, tight. Um, so when, when this bill is passed, um, the devolved legislatures will be blocked from passing legislation that may conflict with it. Um, and this, there are several consequences of this. Um, primarily, um, the issue is that it doesn't prevent a race to the bottom, if you like. So there's a potential for significant deregulatory pressures within um, GB. And the reason this is important for us uh, in Northern Ireland for businesses in Northern Ireland is a uh, concern about say Northern Ireland goods continuing to be produced uh, to EU standards. There are, uh, these tend to be more costly and therefore um, facing um, indirect competition when they're entering the market in GB. There's also concerns about there being a very limited set of exemptions, much more limited than are allowed in the EU single market, for example. Um, and um, there are no guarantees of the UK internal market system operating to certain minimum uh, consumer standards um, or with protections in such areas as environment um, and consumer protection. Another concern is around the ability of the Secretary of State for Bays to be able to amend the restrictions on statutory requirements. Um, and in principle, there may be a requirement to consult with the devolved um, governments, but not to seek their consent. Um, and another concern is about the um, amendment of the Devolution Acts in order to add reserved powers, so it's effectively giving the UK government power to regulate subsidies. Um, this power, formerly held by the EU for GB, and in certain respects it'll be still held by the EU with regards to Northern Ireland and trade covered by the protocol. Um, and then finally, there's no mechanism for intergovernmental relations to manage the internal market. Um, the um, monitoring authority of the CMA is accountable to parliament, uh, but the representation of developed government's interest on this is obviously very limited. So onto the controversial um, or the, the piece of the bill that was unexpected and has generated a lot of um, uh, controversy, I think it's fair to say, are those dimensions relating to the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. These are um, essentially clauses 40 to 45. Um, clause 40 is about um, Northern, Ireland, Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market and customs territory. Um, and although essentially an upshot of this is to, to allow for the full functioning of the protocol, um, it, but um, the, the language is notably vague. So um, authorities implementing the protocol um, are, in, are to have special regard to um, Northern Ireland's integral place in the internal market, its place in the UK customs territory, um, and also the need to facilitate the free flow of goods between Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, the uh, Clause 41 is about unfettered access to the UK internal market for Northern Ireland goods. Um, and in some ways, this clause really um, does it, you know, it, it says it doesn't necessarily prevent a check if it's necessary to secure compliance with an international obligation. But then, of course, we have clause um, 42. And as you'll be aware, um, the principle of unfettered access has been interpreted most particularly by the UK government as meaning that there should be no paperwork whatsoever on goods uh, from Northern Ireland entering GB. Um, and the, uh, as, the, as the UK government has acknowledged uh, in the command paper um, and elsewhere, um, the, uh, officially the EU would expect there to be at least exit summary declarations on goods leaving um, Northern Ireland. This was a point of negotiation and discussion in the Joint Committee. Um, and the explanatory notes accompanying this bill say that the UK is discussing di the disapplication of this requirement. However, Clause 41 of this bill uh, would allow, would provide a power to disapply or modify this requirement. Um, clause 43 is about Article 10 of the 
Northern Ireland Protocol, which is about state aid. Um, so it allows that, so Article 10 allows that EU state aid rules will apply in relation to trade and electricity um, and covers all trade relating to Northern Ireland as, 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 as is covered by the protocol. It's worth reminding ourselves that it doesn't actually ban state aid, um, but if the state aid reaches a certain threshold, um, it does fall within the scope of EU supervision. Um, so um, uh, notification should be given to the Commission and then um, a decision is made as to whether it's acceptable or not, whether it throws, poses a threat to the EU single market. Um, so the bill under this um, clause will give the powers of Secretary of State to make regulations setting out how um, he or she considers this article to be interpreted. And it's only in, in the powers of Secretary of State to do that. Um, uh, that's according to 44. And then on 45, um, basically on those two uh, sections, 43 and 44, 42 around unfettered access and state aid, they are to have effect notwithstanding any relevant international or domestic law with which they may be incompatible. Um, now I was watching the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland giving evidence to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee earlier and he repeated his statement that these provisions are really um, an insurance policy, they're a safety net in the event of a no deal or no agreement between at the joint committee level. However, there is nothing in this bill to indicate that. It's not um, having that as a particular um, clause or condition uh, for this to uh, come into effect. Um, so where this leaves this, well, within, leaves us, well, within the UK, um, we see that those issues around devolution and devolved powers have been um, um, greeted with alarm in Scotland and in Wales. Um, it's been described as a full frontal assault on devolution. Um, and it is worth bearing in mind that these powers do cover services and mutual recognition of qualifications, not just goods. Um, it's, it, it was, um, it, it's been long assumed that there will not be a granting legislative consent from the Scottish and Welsh um, parliaments on this. Uh, um, the consequences with the UK-EU relationship are um, just as severe, if not more severe. So um, there is, as we'll see, we've seen from the letter um, from Aris Sepkovic, who's the co-chair with Michael Gove of the uh, Joint Committee, um, calling on the UK to um, uh, uh, pull back on these plans and to do so clearly by the end of the month. Um, there is no indication of that happening as yet. We have yet to see what's going to happen in Parliament about any amendments to this bill, but it is pretty clear that the intention is to, to, for the government to give themselves these powers. Um, and fundamentally, we see, therefore, um, a, a significant increase in the likelihood of a no deal uh, between the UK and the EU, which inevitably means um, a, a negative consequences for uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and what that means for the uh, for the implementation of the protocol and uh, the wider stability of um, the political scene here is sort of um, really yet to be uh, discussed. Um, we can uh, we may talk about that in the questions. Thank you. Um, Kitty, thank you very much for that. Um, you have addressed many of. I suppose some of the, the questions that I would have had around it and I would just pick up initially on what you've said there about the, the Scottish and Welsh government's um, responses um, describing it as a full frontal assault and devolution um, because contrary to that we've had very pr provocative um, claims from, from British ministers that this is supposed to be um, you know a to protect the Good Friday Agreement, um, when in fact it, it undermines all three strands of the, the Good Friday Agreement, as, as outlined there in relation to what it does for devolution, not being able to pass legislation that conflicts, um, you know, removing some of those, those powers to Westminster, um, but it also undermines North-South cooperation and coordination, particularly in relation to EU matters and other areas of cooperation. And obviously, they ignores the obligation for the British and Irish governments um, to re use best endeavours to, to reach agreement on areas of cooperation and mutual interest. Um, 
So I, I guess, um, in, what would you say in, in response to that? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's quite clear that, uh, and again, reflecting what the Secretary of State has been saying, they, they, there is uh, the justification for it in some ways um, has been about meeting the interests of Northern Ireland's economy and giving certainty to businesses. And there has been considerable mention of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. I think the, the key question is, will the protocol be implemented? And will it be implemented effectively or not? Um, a lot depends on that. I mean, we should be clear that um, th the effects of this um, of this bill as it relates to the protocol are quite limited. So we could have expected um, that the EU may well have given away given way on the issue of ex exit summary declarations because one might argue actually the negative impact of that could be for the for the UK um, um, as there are consequences therefore of it knowing what's circulating within its own market um, so that the EU may well have conceded on that the issue of state aid again um, I, I don't I think that's, you know, the, the protocol isn't wholly undermined by what powers could potentially be given to the um, to the UK government under this um, bill. Um, so it's a it's a uh, yeah. So if the protocol continues to stand and to be in effect, then there are considerable reassurances. Uh, for Northern Ireland vis-a-vis -vis free movement of goods um, across the single market and indeed on North-South cooperation. Article 11, for example, covers quite a lot in that regard. Um, so I'd be, I'd be cautious about saying that it, can, that it challenges or undermines the Good Friday Belfast Agreement um, because um, so much protection of that comes through the protocol. And in relation there to your point that you, you make about the implementation of the protocol, uh, the protocol without uh, a free trade agreement, how difficult is that and where it clashes directly with what is being proposed in this internal market bill? Yeah, so, so I mean... It's, it seems a little crass to say, but it's fundamentally true. If we if we have a breakdown in the UK EU relationship, um, which n I should reiterate, the the UK and the EU are saying that they don't want that. But if that is the case, if they if the UK is really not prepared to move on this at all, and the EU is not prepared to move, and we have a breakdown, and then we have a no deal, the the biggest challenge will be. The lack of trust i mean complete lack of trust in that relationship um and this will be a worry for the with regards to the protocol because the protocol is a risk for both the uk and the eu in many regards um fundamentally for the eu it's, it's a bit of an act of faith because they are trusting that the uk authorities will be implementing the protocol implementing those necessary checks and controls uh, on goods entering Northern Ireland from GB and elsewhere. So um, there's, and similarly to, um, as we know, the UK government has been seeking um, some negotiations with the, with the EU in relation to the full force of the protocol and, and what it means, uh, most particularly on restrictions on goods entering Northern Ireland. So if you, if you have a situation where there is a lack of trust in that relationship, um, then we do have a consequence of pressure um, and um, increased suspicion around what might be happening for Northern Ireland. And, I, and I, it's not just political, of course. It's there are all sorts of knock-on effects with regards to what how people view Northern Ireland um, and the reputation of goods from Northern Ireland um, within the single market and elsewhere. Uh, so yeah, the. the the consequences of a no deal um, for here would be very severe. Even if we did have a situation where the protocol was being properly implemented, I mean, then you just have the range of goods just 
in, at risk and, and with um, tariffs needing to be applied on them, uh, at least in principle, entering Northern Ireland from GB, I mean, that would go up considerably. Um, and, the, and the scope of the protocol, the impact of the protocol would be felt all the more in the event of a no deal. And, and uh, that's one reason why it would be um, a negative outcome for Northern Ireland. Yeah, and just then, um, I, and you mentioned, you know, about this this bill, um, you know, potentially helping businesses within that that particular market. Um, obviously, businesses have argued for for the protocol that they they are supportive of it and, and the protections provided by it. Is it a, is it a bit of a contradiction then that we have this bill which is undermining trust between the the British government and the EU and the chances of getting a free trade agreement um, that is going to be protect businesses um, and allow a, a smoother implementation of, of the protocol is, is that a contradiction in terms between you know bringing forward this legislation to protect businesses but at the same time completely undermining that um, negotiation? I mean, so businesses have been wanting certainty for some time, and I know in response to the consultation that was issued on the white paper, businesses here, and I'm not speaking for everyone by any means, but I think the general sense of it was it would be good to be clear um, or to have reassurances that Northern Ireland goods would not be discriminated against in GB and that there would be market access from Northern Ireland into GB even if there were constraints in the other direction. Um, and so this would be the, uh, this would be some the principle behind some of this bill, right? That it would be attempting to give certainty and, and assurances in that regard. Now the scope of it, as I say, is quite, is considerable. And there are, uh, there, are, there are concerns around that, which we may discuss in more detail. But fundamentally, that is something that businesses have asked for. I, I think it's worth noting that the, the huge, a lot of the controversy, um, you know, the principle of unfettered access, it, it was a concern. Um, but there are, there are many, many other issues for uh, Northern Ireland business that we're looking for certainty on um, around the implementation of the protocol um around what qualifying status is for example i mean very technical detailed things around labeling etc um that's what businesses are wanting certainty from so uh i mean uh, uh, that that is you know this this goes in some ways this could be said to be going some way towards giving certainty in the, in a very specific area but a knock-on effect of this this uh, um, trying attempt to take powers to disapply parts of the protocol is um, raising uncertainty in the whole environment within which uh, we're having to prepare for the end of the transition period. Yeah. Um, and, and just one final one for me before I hand over to some other members for questions. Um, Article 2 of the protocol um, commits to no diminution of rights. Um, and I guess just given some of the statements that there were in the British media over the, the weekend around the, the intent in relation to discipline ECHR, um, looking again at the Human Rights Act, are there concerns there um, that we may be looking at other areas of the protocol that potentially could be under threat? Um, well, again, this is why the protocol is seen as Im important. Um, is that it doesn't just ob obviously cover trade; it is around key issues around human rights and north south, etc. So, um, we, if you're looking at the progress that's been made in um, on those kind of matters, and I'm I'm not an expert in that area. I know there's many outstanding concerns, but fundamentally. Um, there are indications of um, tr trying to protect human rights and to, um, to follow on from the commitments made in the protocol. And there has been some progress on that, albeit um, not quite adequate as yet. Um, but again, it, it all depends on the, the full implementation of the protocol. Um, and I, you know, the, the, the government is, is 
repeating that it intends to implement the protocol. Um, and you see other, um, you know, signs of this in the trader support service, et cetera. So I, I wouldn't want to be too, um, I want to be careful about giving the impression that the protocol itself is under threat. Um, uh, uh, but I would say if it is, then we're in a, in a very dangerous situation, yeah. Um, Sinead, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Can we bring Sinead? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Hi, uh, um, thank you very much, um, Katie, for that um, briefing this morning. Uh, I suppose I, I believe that every single member of the Legislative Assembly should be concerned about this bill because it is really a power grab. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, Scotland and Wales ha have kicked up a, a fuss about it and, and the Northern Ireland Executive seems to be sitting back waiting on, on things to happen to us rather than actually uh, being proactive and preventing this bill going forward. Um, one of the things that I would like to say, because there's an awful lot of um, bombastic um, uh, statements been made by, by the Tory government, but can you finally say once and for all, does the withdrawal uh, agreement th threaten food supplies um, into Northern Ireland? Uh, and, and then also, I want to kind of ask your opinion about um, within the UK, the internal market uh, bill, um, does it offer unfettered access from GB for Northern Ireland goods if there's no agreement on the critical route because um, via Dublin, because most, about 50% of our food pr uh, produced here in Northern Ireland actually goes into the GB market via Dublin. And I'm concerned about that in relation to the internal, uh, the, uh, internal marketing bill as well. Okay. So your first question about is about the purported threat of the EU blockading food supplies into Northern Ireland. So um, essentially, that that isn't a threat uh, for three main reasons. One is that it's the UK authorities who are implementing the protocol. Um, uh, the second is that the whole issue has arisen from the fact that the EU, the EU hasn't yet um, given the UK third country listing with regards to SPS and um, um, unrated products entering um, the EU, including Northern Ireland. Um, but that's really because they're waiting on the UK to um, state the standards that, that will be being met and, and the way that those standards will be conformed with. So it's just waiting for the necessary information from the UK on that. Um, and it may well have mentioned that to the UK in the negotiations. I don't know. It's not the same as a blockade. And the, U the EU has already a couple of times listed the EU for, uh, sorry, the UK for that um, when there was when there was concerns about a no deal um, um, outcome. So it, the UK still needs to be listed, but it needs to provide the information to do that. And then the third point is that in the protocol, um, Article 16 does have safeguards in such eventuality um, that either side actually can act unilaterally um, um, to avoid a, a, a such dire situation. So the threat of a bl blockade is, is, is really non-existent. Um, the issue around unfettered access, so you're picking up a really important point. So even if you're looking in detail at how, you know, how unfettered access is defined, um, what we've seen even in the command paper and elsewhere is that the UK government has really been focusing on direct access from NI into GB. Um, and uh, you can understand that to some degree. Um, what it hasn't been yet promising is unfettered access via other routes, specifically Dublin. And that's because of course, then you have another um, port involved and you have another authority. So the full unfettered access, you'd have to have uh, the Irish, with the permission of the EU waiving paperwork, whatever, um, waiving export declarations from, for goods from Northern Ireland going into GB, that's, that would be a huge ask. The UK government could act unilaterally and say, 
for Northern Ireland goods entering Holyhead, for example, we won't be requiring import declarations. We haven't yet seen that, and this bill doesn't go as far as to specify that or particularly to allow it. Um, so I wouldn't be reassured that unfettered access by indirect routes is guaranteed at all by this bill. And just one quick uh, question as well. Um, what issues does the state aid decision by the UK present uh, on the delivery of the protocol agreement and the future relationship? What do you, what do you see as the challenges there? So, I mean, I, we know that the state aid has been a huge um, point of contention between the UK and the EU. So this is the, this is, if you like, is the, is the real crux of the matter because this is something that goes beyond Northern Ireland and Ireland Protocol to being about the UK-EU future relationship. Um, and um, this, this provision in the bill recognises the fact that there could potentially be a reach into GB um, as a consequence of this protocol, and it would be basically that state aid rules of the EU would affect GB-based businesses if they have some um, um, if they're operating in Northern Ireland, it affects trade as, as it relates to Northern Ireland. Um, and clearly the UK government is wanting to prevent that and it explicitly says that in the bill um, that it relates to, to beyond Northern Ireland. Um, the consequences, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, impos it's possible to see it as a, as a real negotiating tack in that the UK government wanted to say, um, well, even just to sort of um, up the ante a wee bit to say, well, you know, we can take matters into our own hands on this on the, on this regard, and to try and change the dynamics of what was being negotiated and, and the standoff that was happening at the UKU level. Um, it's it it's clearly hasn't worked. If that was the intention, it hasn't worked the way they expected it to. Um, and really, as you say, a big big point then is about the trust between them because they because it really um, suggests that um, even the, the agreement that was negotiated between them is now in doubt. So uh, the consequences of that, you can see the rationale perhaps behind that approach, but the consequences of it are, are far reaching and go way beyond the protocol. Yeah. Okay, a lot for us to be worried about. Thank you very much again, uh, Katie, for your um, briefing this morning. Thank you. Sinead. Um, John? Uh, th thank you, Katie. Um, another very interesting presentation this morning. I don't know if you managed to hear the presentation previous to your own in terms of uh, the state of the economy and, and the likely state of it right up to 2024. Uh, the uncertainty around this obviously adds to our economic worries. Um, what, why use a hammer to crack a nut in the sense of this could have been worked out in the Joint committee in terms of negotiations. Uh, but what, what, what's the strategy here? What, what's, what are, what's the British government trying to achieve uh, through this strategy, do you think? Uh, it may so, be an unfair question to you in terms of academic, but just in terms of an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, they've never asked me for a strategy in relation to any of this. So I, I think. Um, So the government would say, so as I say, the Secretary of State is saying it's a safety net. So just in case you don't have an agreement with, at the joint committee level um, on unfettered access in particular, about the need for exit summary declarations, uh, then those can still be disapplied or waived by the UK government. Um, and they would say, you know, they say they're saying that that's in order to give businesses certainty that at least in that direction, um, we can be sure that there, sh there won't be any paperwork needed on entering GB directly. Uh, um, when it comes to the a, a strategy, though, I I don't know. It's just too easy to speculate and to sort of wonder what on earth is going on. But I do think because of the state aid in, being included in this bill, very particularly. And the fact that that's the that's the main way in which the Northern Ireland Ireland Protocol affects GB, um, I do think that it's no you know 
there's no coincidence that this is the one that's really been um, uh, um, you know, that that they are enabling themselves to act in a way that's incompatible and inconsistent with um, domestic and international law. It's in order to take take back that that power to themselves on that regard, and if, in some ways to kind of uh, draw a clear blue line between what's applying in Northern Ireland and what should apply in GB. Well, is it not the case that in terms of trade talks and, and Britain will enter trade talks, they hope, around the world, and there's speculation of the one with Japan at the minute, the state aid rules within those negotiations of that agreement are actually stricter than those in which the EU are seeking? Mm. It's not a case where uh, any nation is going to enter trade with Britain and, and allow unfair advantage uh, to traders in Britain against their own, their own, their own companies. Yeah, so state aid is a you know it's a, it, it was always going to be a big a big issue in these future relationship negotiations and um, because of the need for a level playing field in that regard and to avoid distorting competition um, to maintain that inter- you know the EU's internal market we can see why state aid is included um, uh, with some exceptions in the protocol um, uh, but uh, and you know, one upshot of all of this is that the UK, if we're going to have progress being made in the in the UK EU talks, um, in a funny way, it's actually, you know, looking at what's coming out from Brussels and elsewhere, it's actually just made the issue that much harder. So whereas the EU was wanting certain things from the UK, mainly reassurances around independent regulator in this regard, it's going to be. Um, even more hardline in, in what it's wanting to see before it's prepared to have an agreement on that on that matter, um, and this is why this is one reason why, you know, the, um, regardless of the intentions behind this move, and as I say, we can only speculate on that. The outcome of it is um, increasing the likelihood of a no deal. Okay, uh, the the powers that are bestowed on the Secretary of State as a result of this bill. Um, one, one, who holds them to account, him or her in the future? Uh, I understand there may no, there may, may not be recourse to judicial review around some of the decisions, uh, which strikes me that we end up with somebody with significant power. This image in my head of an old colonial governor sitting in the big house on the hill, looking down on his subjects, directing uh, their operations, uh, which devalues completely, in my opinion. Uh, the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement and the parish Sharon institution I'm currently sitting in. But so the was my main trust. Who holds the Secretary of State to account? Um, well, this is a concern around quite a number of matters in relation to this bill and indeed other matters around secondary legislation and the powers that ministers have um as a as a consequence of the handling of the repatriation of powers from brussels um and obviously this concern has been raised by the devolved legislatures in many regards um so in principle these powers are in the hands of the ministers um and as to the holding to account um they have they have those they have those powers now the the CMA and the monitoring authority um, for uh, f- you know for the UK internal market the new functions that it will have um, they that will be reviewing the operation of the UK internal market um, every few years or so so that could be a point at which um, you know concerns are really brought to the fore. Um, but that's as much as I can say. I might be missing something very obvious, but I can't. Um, that's that's the answer to give at the moment. Well, I, I suspect you haven't missed something obvious because it's not your style uh, to be missing the, the detail of these things. But it, this is an area of, of concern, obviously, um, as a local elected representative in, in a locally elected institution. That one, we can't hold them to account. And it would appear that uh, no one can hold them to account, him or her, in the future. 
uh, to our current in relation to which is, is, is such an important matter. But thank you for your contribution. Um, Kitty, just in relation to the, the, the claims that it's an insurance policy um, by, by putting it in place, um, the deadline that they've attached to it of, of the 15th of October, is it, isn't that, is it is the 15th of October? It's a very tight turnaround. Is that deliberate, do, do you think, to, to try and force the pace of negotiation? Um, so, I mean, there is this, a huge amount of legislation needs to be passed um, to give us relative um, clarity about, you know, what's going to happen after the end of transition. This isn't just in relation to this bill. Um, the, the EU has set the deadline of the end of September to, to get, um, you know, for the UK government to, to do an about turn on this particular matter. Um, and that's really because of the timetable that the UK EU is facing. So the um, the next council, European Council, is is around that time, the middle of October. And as you know, that had been the point at which we'd all expect, well, not expected, but <laughs> anticipated that would be the, the council at which the final UK EU deal would be signed off. That's not going to happen now. Um, and so, you know, uh, at least in one area of, of domestic legislation, albeit um, one that is contested and obviously, uh, you know, and will not have the consent of at least Scotland and Wales, um, that if this is in, if this is in UK wide legislation at that point, it will give certainty in some regards, albeit um, um, a type of certainty that um, raises great concerns from many quarters. Thank you. Gary, can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, um, and thanks, Kitty, for uh, your presentation and sharing your views today. It's very much appreciated. Um, I, I suppose uh, two questions. I'll ask the first question um, and then let you respond, and then I'll ask the second question. Uh, the first question, I suppose, like yourself, I've been following uh, the conversations from the Secretary of State at the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee uh, this morning, whilst, of course, engaging on the very interesting conversations that we've had in our own committee. Uh, Brandon Lewis had indicated that, that the UK government have been very clear that they do not want to see and they will not um, uh, return to, to a customs border on the island of Ireland. Um, you know, that, that's what he said, and that's for others to interpret how, how that uh, can be done. Um, obviously, from a unionist perspective, there has been a lot of concern around um, the idea of a border in the Irish Sea. Uh, there's been a lot of, um, uh, I suppose, emphasis placed on the fact that uh, the Good Friday Agreement uh, should be adhered to and that, that, that a border in the island of Ireland would, would breach that. What is your view in terms of... Um, the, the, the internal border within the uh, kingdom, the border in the ABC, and do you feel that that uh, would breach the Good Friday Agreement? Um, certainly there have been concerns expressed about an Irish Sea border, to, to use that, um, you know, it's not a great phrase, but to use that phrase. And that's not just from unionists, it's from businesses as well, um, and indeed from consumers. It, it, you know, um, any you know, the greater restrictions that we have, the, the more cost involved in, in goods coming into to NI from GB, the worse it, the worse it is for the economy. That's just a that's just a fact. Um, and I think an, another fact is the more the UK diverges from the EU, um, the greater the challenges for NI. Um, and a consequence of the protocol, as it was written and um, as, as agreed by Johnson, is that you know the full force of that divergence, in effect, comes into play in the Irish Sea, um, and as was pointed out in the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee this morning, you know at the time Johnson was um, absolutely clear that that didn't breach the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and was entirely in accordance with it. Um, and in and of itself, it, it doesn't necessarily breach the agreement, but I think that the, there's the, the question of 
what it actually means in practice. And this goes back to it's it's rather unsatisfactorily sort of vague, but it is absolutely true that if you have a breakdown in if you have an ODL first and foremost, and therefore the requirements on restrictions on goods coming into NI from GB will be that much greater. And then if you have a breakdown in trust around it, um, whereby you you know this is what we're going through now is just a small indication of what may happen after the end of transition, then we're in a very dire situation, which does lead to instability, not just, of course, in the UK EU relationship, but in the British Irish relationship, and therefore putting the whole context for the um, 1998 agreement under pressure. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, again, and I suppose uh, I mentioned, you know, you're absolutely right. Businesses are, are very concerned about that as well. And I think we can all agree that the lack of certainty isn't good. Uh, so, you know, we, we can all agree on that. And I think that the sooner that businesses can get clarity, um, uh, that, that's better for us all. I suppose to move on uh, to my next question, and it's to follow on from Shane's point around um, the, the uh, alleged food or potential food blockade in terms of Northern Ireland. You'll be aware of um, David Frost, the, the UK chief negotiator's position in respect of those conversations uh, with the EU. Uh, he did say that um, the EU's position is that listing is needed for Great Britain only, not Northern Ireland. So if GB were not listed, it would be automatically illegal for Northern Ireland to import food products from GB. Do you do you think that you know David Frost is is not telling the truth, or you know is he overstating the reality of the situation? Um, so uh, it's uh, the use of the word blockade wasn't helpful. I think he's he's. It's true that if GB goods don't meet the sands and don't aren't listed as um, compliant. Indeed, it goes many <laughs> aren't meeting those EU standards, and they won't officially. They won't. They, it'd be um, prohibited from entering Northern Ireland, right? Um, and in such a situation whereby the UK doesn't produce the necessary information, which would be producing in, you know, it, this is what the UK would have insisted on it when when it was in the EU. You know, it's a it's a standard thing. It's not a big. It, you know, it's not controversial there's a logic and a reason for it but anyway if that's not produced um so the uk so the you can't list the uk in that regard then yeah there, there will be difficulty in in um in principle in those goods entering northern Ireland. but this is why i mentioned that safeguard in the protocol um which is basically if so this is the article 16 if the application of this protocol leads to serious economic societal or environmental difficulties that are liable to persist um, or to diversion of trade, the union or the UK may unilaterally take appropriate safeguard measures. Um, and there's also all those um, uh, opportunities for uh, negotiation, arbitration, etc., around the implementation of the protocol. So, um, at, at no point was there, a, a, you know, has there been a, a risk of that kind of scenario whereby we're we're all starving, you know? It's just it's, it's it was never really on the cards. But the, the key point does stand, though, that Northern Ireland, the consequence of the protocol is that Northern Ireland is following those EU standards, and the, that's, those are the standards of goods um, entering Northern Ireland. Okay, look, thanks for your time. Uh, it is much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. Kitty, thank you very much. Can um, I just ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead, John. Kitty, just on that, on that last point, has the EU ever placed a food blockade on any nation? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I don't I think it's no. <laughs> okay. um, Kitty, thank you very much. It was really, really useful, and, and we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us this morning, and I'm sure we'll be all watching with interest as this plays out. Um, in great detail over the next few weeks um, and maybe you will come back and enlighten us some more in, yeah. in a future date. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving on then to our next briefing which is from Excluded NI on the impact of COVID-19 and the access to support. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 30, 348 of your pack 
an overview um, of excluded NI or excluded UK, sorry, at page 351. Um, there's a further item of correspondence from excluded NI at page 82 of your table papers regarding the finance minister's willingness to provide financial support. So I'd like to welcome to our meeting Brian, Brian Donaldson, who is the spokesperson for excluded NI. Um, and Brian, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you get me? Yeah, we can indeed. So if I hand over to you to make uh, an opening statement and then we'll open it up to members for questions. Super. Thank you very much for having us on today. Um, the key for us as a group is really to put forward what we can do for economic growth going forward. Um, Northern Ireland is classed as a micro enterprise economy. Um, with 94% of businesses employing less than 10 people and 72% of that do not employ anybody. Uh, those businesses make up 20% of the jobs within the private sector and uh, that equates to 11% of the turnover. So the importance of our group of microenterprises is key going forward. Um, the stats around it are quite big in the sense that there's 134,000 self-employed people in Northern Ireland. Um, we do work within all sectors uh, and support all sectors within the economy. Um, the, the biggest occupation within the self-employed is skilled trades and directors, which uh, through today's meeting, we've heard about reskilling and skilling people when we have quite a lot of skilled people within our department uh, or within our sector. So it brings us on to the scheme that were launched um, and those schemes were massive uh, and they were important to the economy, something that we're a part of uh, and we're grateful for what has been done to date. Um, and it's been quite reactive. So the, the job retention scheme was launched first, and then obviously SEISS came after that uh, as a reaction to the amount of people that missed out on the job retention scheme. So it's been positive to see that there has been reaction to schemes that haven't reached everybody. So the SEIS uh, in Northern Ireland had the biggest take up um, of the UK regions. Uh, with 78,000 people out of 98,000 eligible took the scheme up, which was 81%. But where we failed in that was that 38% were unable to reach that SEISS support. Um, and while other devolved regions had, had seen their percentages in around 31, 32%, they then reacted to that uh, and brought about additional support measures. The fact that we had the highest amount that we're all able to access the support and haven't really reacted uh, very quickly to that is is alarming for us um, so what we add to the economy can be can be huge going forward if you take for instance B&Bs um, they can drive anywhere up to a quarter of a million pound in the tourism uh, and I know there's a lot of talk at the minute about supporting tourism uh, and we can do that but B&Bs have been left out uh, of that support and we need people like NITA, Hospitality Ulster, Tourism NI to really start looking towards supporting those people and certainly putting proposals to, to the Minister. Um, I had a meeting with the Minister last week and I thank Stuart for, for bringing that meeting along um, with Andrew Moore and it was productive and, and, and things that we did talk about were <sighs> The endless funding that we don't have, um, but we are seeing to spend money in areas that uh, the, the four million pound for tourism I brought up with the minister, and the key for me in that was the four million pound marketing. Um, we could have spent that within the self-employed sector. Uh, the biggest marketing that we have for SMEs is is word of mouth. Uh, the reason why I personally. Uh, made the jump from PAY to tourism or, or to self-employed was word of mouth. I spoke to somebody that was in my position and, and made that move. So we have 30,000 people potentially excluded. And if we're talking about growing and getting new business, it doesn't matter what scheme is launched or what three word logo that we invest money in. People will go to somebody else that has made the move 
for, for that advice. And at the minute, we've got 30,000 people that aren't overly pleased with the move they've made and the support that's came from that. So instead of spending £4 million in marketing, we could have spent that money in the self-employed sector and that's free marketing after that because my advice was from somebody that made the move was to go for it. It's great, uh, family life's better, uh, the money's good uh, and you have a real sense of purpose. Whereas now the 30,000 people that will be given the advice going forward won't have that same opinion uh, and it doesn't matter how much we spend on marketing it won't matter because the opinion that we haven't been helped and we go back to Mike Brennan's comments that, that some businesses just aren't worth saving, um, that will be detrimental going forward for economic growth. And that's what's key is, and I spoke to the minister and I said, we are key to economic growth and to take John and Doug's sort of comments that we need to hold what we have and build from there. And that does um, bring us into the market and the free marketing that we can bring and advise businesses to make the leap from PAYE and help boost the economy um, going forward. Um, I think what we have now, sorry, I just catch my notes here. Um, you can break them down into groups as well. I think Kiva mentioned it yesterday, the newly self-employed. So we can tailor packages and the minister has shown that she can tailor packages when it suits. So the five million pound equity loan that was launched, um, it, it's tailored to a 6% market because 94% of businesses in Northern Ireland don't meet that criteria. So they have the information there that they can tailor packages and the money is available. Um, I don't accept the comments that we had yesterday that we can't help everybody, but we certainly can't accept that there's money there and we're going to help nobody. It, it has to start coming forward now with tailored packages driven by the economy because we will drive the economy as we grow and survive through these uh, very difficult times for, for a lot of people. Um, and it's not just the business side too, I suppose it's, it's the mental health side. Um, that's really sort of shining a light now on how people feel valued by the government um, with obviously no support coming. They can feel very valued um, and they, without that value, it's hard to have a progressive um, growth. I know myself from being in many teams that to flourish and grow in any aspect of business, you really need everybody on board. Um, so we, we've got to feel that value coming from, uh, first of all, who's the economy minister to put bids in. Um, that, that, that's key. Without the bids, we um, we don't have a chance. Um, and we've heard that it's maybe not the economy minister's remit to bid for us, but um, I would disagree with that in the sense that we are a, a driving force behind the economy. And as you heard from the, the numbers at the start, the the micro enterprise economy is what we are and we are the epitome of um, the Northern Ireland economy. So we we do fall into the, the economy minister's remit. Um, it's not just tourism and hospitality. They have received um, massive support, uh, which helps me to in my line of work because I work within the hospitality. So again, thanks to the minister for doing that, but I'll sort of finish up and in, in what I want to say. Um, with all the support that came, we appreciate that, that we were unintentionally excluded um, because it needed a blanket support. The blanket support came uh, and that helped many people. Um, and then the second round of help came and again, it was more of a blanket support and a, and a, and a reaction. And Again, we feel we were unintentionally excluded. But now when we're coming around to the third and fourth tranches of support, um, and this has been highlighted uh, by, I suppose, every MLA, um, that we're now running the risk of becoming intentionally excluded. Uh, and that that can't happen, uh, not in this day and age. And certainly we're looking into that um, on other lines, but, the support has been great, 
but getting the additional support to the people that need it has proved very difficult and a slow process. And I think when you have, um, I've probably made mistakes in this crash course that I've had in uh, Northern Ireland politics. Um, you have public sector meets private sector, um, and we do have a, a different drive behind us in the sense that we just get stuff done. Um, and that's something the economy should be proud of, and certainly the economy minister should be supporting uh, and getting well behind us. But I think I'll leave it at that now and, and open it to the members. And Brian, thank you very much for, for that. Um, and it is useful to hear from yourself um, uh, representing the, the wider group um, firsthand. Obviously, you, you will be aware that as a committee we have... Um, been highlighting the, the groups that have been excluded for, for many months um, and the need to, to try um, and get that, as you described it, tailored approach to, to support. Um, that's something that we have been advocating for, feel very much could be done and should be done. Um, I, as you mentioned yourself, there, there is information available to the department that would enable those schemes to be, to be set up and to be directed. Um, and as, as you outlined there, you know this, this is about businesses and entrepreneurs that are the backbone of our economy um, and people who have been encouraged to take that leap um, to become self-employed, to set up a business. And you know if we are looking to instill that confidence into to people in the future, well then we, we do need to see that support coming for people now in, in these difficult times. Um, we, we've heard before, you know, the, the types of schemes, and we've seen the consp the comparisons um, with, with Scotland. I, I, you know, for the newly self-employed, um, I think that there is still opportunities to look to put in place supports like that. Um, and I, I, you know, we've, we've some groups have now been um, taken care of, but there are still those that that, that are missing out. Um, the newly self-employed. Could you want to maybe talk us through where where, where you see the gaps remaining? Uh, well, yeah. No, what we met with the minister, and we we constantly heard the word difficulties um, around things. But I think the minister was paid to do difficult jobs, uh, and, and that's why she's in that role. So even simple suggestions that we made in the meeting for newly self-employed. Um, really seem to be new news or something that nobody had ever thought about, but the support can be made very easily with a unique taxpayer reference number. So I can I can take a unique taxpayer reference number from the tax man and give it to my accountant and my accountant can access my tax there for, to verify um, many things. So the Department of Economy can do this. Let's not forget there's a thousand people in the Department of Economy. Uh, there's plenty of staff there to administer these sort of things. So I guess that's our frustration is that there is no thinking outside the box. It's it's too difficult and um, they're, they're just failing us in that sense that they're not working hard enough. In fact, I was told during the meeting that I should applaud uh, some people in the Department of Economy for working late on a Friday and a Saturday night once uh, to try and make one support scheme. Um, to be honest, I think they should be working a lot harder for the micro enterprise economy that we have um, constantly. Um, but our, uh, that's one group, the, the limited company um, directors as well missed out. Um, and they are, they're, they employ people, they drive people to, to better themselves. And um, they are a niche market uh, and they do um, advocate business growth in Northern Ireland. Um, I think our, our taxi drivers, Coach and Hollier, um, have eventually been sorted out and given a direction, and a, it's taken far too long to do that. Um, childcare are in the group as well. They did receive some form of support, but from what I read into it, it was uh, for the individual childcare provider was the guts of £300 um, for staying open uh, and supporting NHS staff to go to work and, and keep us safe. And I, and I think what the package that they were offered um, was a joke. Um, but we need the executive 
as they have done with the infrastructure minister and came down and said, sort this package out. Whether that was right or wrong, it's not up for me, but it was a positive. Um, uh, does the economy minister really need to be told that she needs to sort the economy out? Maybe that's where we're at. Um, thanks for that, Brian. And I suppose just another an additional point to make is we are still through the finance minister uh, and ourselves in um, communication with the, the Treasury around the, the widening of the, the self-employed income support scheme to to also take into account some of those groups that have been missed out. And, and we will continue to highlight that aspect of things as well. Um, John Stewart, can I bring you into the spotlight, please? Uh, yeah, that's me, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, hi, Brian. You can't see me, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, thank you for your presentation today. Um, and thank you for the lobbying and the passionate way you have represented the many thousands of businesses and self-employed people across Northern Ireland who, as you know, have been unable to avail of any support to date. Um, hopefully you will know that a number of us have been in your corner and fighting these battles um, since back in April, and if you watched the debate yesterday and the motion I brought to the Assembly, and I know you did, you will see um, you know, the, the path that we've been on to try and secure that support. Um, I think it was deeply regrettable whenever that hardship grant that we thought would probably be able to tie up a lot of the loose ends for those particularly affected, um, ruled in, then ruled out, then ruled in, then ruled out again, um, yourself and many others, and that was deeply regrettable and a real kick in the teeth. Um, and I genuinely thought whenever we heard them back in June and July that it was going to be clear that there was going to be a massive underspend in the grant scheme, that that could be instantly repackaged into something looking like a secondary hardship fund for the excluded um, business community. Um, that money had all but been spent in that it had already been allocated to grant support in different guises, albeit, um, and it would have been the perfect starting point um, and a significant sum of almost 60 million, as you know. Um, and that is what we've been pushing for, and I think that's what we need to continue to push for. Um, I don't accept the point that we even need the raw data from HMRC, although it can probably be got if they really did lobby for it. I think, as you'll know, Brian, I probably agree, there are a lot of businesses and self-employed people and small micro-businesses that have done quite well during the lockdown and aren't in difficulties, but there are others who are earnest in their will to survive, but through no fault of their own, cannot trade or can't trade in the circumstances that they used to be able to trade. And is that hardship that needs to be identified and then supported through this pandemic? And that can be done because the £25,000 grant was predicated upon hardship, and the hardship grant was predicated upon hardship. So that can be done as well, and that can be done quite quickly while that data um, needs to be sought. Um, it wasn't really more of a question, but it was just more of a statement. But I'm sure, hopefully, you'll agree with that. And do you agree that you know it's not every business out there? Because a lot of people are trying to price this out of the equation with ridiculous figures. That is not the fact. It's not every micro business that is in needing this, but the ones that do do need it now. Uh, yeah, hundred uh, percent. Thank you for your motion yesterday, and again to. Um, I'm pretty sure raising support from everybody uh, about the, the plates that we have. Um, it, 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 is, it isn't every business that needs this. And I suppose the numbers do look scary whenever you you sort of look at maybe 30,000 people that, that are technically excluded, but not all need the help. Um, but certainly some do. And I just think the inactivity... Um, if the same inactivity happened in the private sector, we would have no economy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's what I think that's the frustrating thing um, for us looking in towards Stormont is the inactivity just, it takes me away sometimes. Um, and I just I hope that we have more progressive actions coming from the minister over the next few weeks. Um, I do know through some people that they're scrambling around to try and get figures. Um, I was probably disappointed when I came to the meeting and presented figures that not one figure was questioned, which will go in line with what John O'Dowd had said yesterday, that the, the decision was a no a long time ago. Uh, they just haven't 
came forward with that. So I think there is a change in, in the sea and, and help may be on the way, but um, certainly not at the pace we would expect it to come from um, if it was in the private sector. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I don't want to take up too much more time because I know there's other members wanting to get in, um, but I, I think sadly I do agree with you. I think that decision has been has been taken a long time ago strategically, um, and that was clearly evidenced by the leadership of, of the department through the Department of Secretary's comments um, two or three weeks ago to this committee, which were deeply regrettable. And again, another real kick in the teeth to businesses that have not been able to avail to date. I think that is deeply, deeply frustrating. But hopefully yesterday's motion did send a strong message to the Minister. Um, it was unanimous support from across the House. And as you say, so many members spoke with so much passion about the businesses in their constituency that they represent. And we all know them. I was one. I started off as a self-employed business person. I know the lengths you have to go to. Um, you don't want handouts. You don't, you, you often, you, you know, that's not why you become self-employed. You certainly don't do it for the money most of the time, because if you did, you'd be on less than minimum wage. But um, in terms of the, the, the hours you're working. But I think when, whenever things do do get difficult, there is a requirement to identify that and, and, and to support it. And it is deeply regrettable that we haven't seen something to date, but hopefully that message resonated with the Minister yesterday. And I honestly cannot see any reason why a package, why a bid cannot be put to the Finance Minister via the Department of Economy, what possible rationale there is not to submit that and then put the ball firmly into the court of of other executive ministers. And as I said yesterday, then the pressure can come to mind in them to see if that, that money can be provided. As I say, we do not need the raw data, something can be concocted quite quickly. And um, I hope through your lobbying and through the sustained pressure from this committee and others that we do see that come very soon. But thanks, Brian. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, John. Um, John Stewart. Thank you. Uh, Brian, good afternoon. Um, thank you for, for coming with me last week to meet the minister and um, as John Stewart has just said, um, the information that you provided to us uh, assisted us in, in shaping the debate yesterday. I think having met with the Minister and having had the Minister in the Assembly Chamber yesterday um, taking part in the debate, she really needs to appreciate that this issue is not going to go away. And it's not going to go away for a whole range of very important reasons. No political party would want to be left um, being blamed uh, for the deliberate closure of businesses. And that's the situation that we're in. People can blame COVID. People can blame Brexit. They can blame the downturn in the economy for businesses rising and falling. But no politician wants to take the blame themselves for being responsible for businesses closing. And that is the sum effect of the failure of this minister to um, be sufficiently innovative to devise appropriate schemes. And John Stewart also raised the point uh, in his last contribution about the, the, the incredible myth that this is some hom homogeneous group of people that are all demanding the same amount of money. Nothing could be further from the mm -hmm. truth. So I'm glad to hear, because I know you've told me and you've repeated it again today, that there now seem to be some moves in the department to try and assess the extent of the issue by trying to work out what the numbers are. And my question to you, and I probably do know the answer to this, is will your group work extensively uh, with the department to provide them with the figures that they need to break yourselves down into small groups, into small bites, and to make proposals for uh, several hundred people who might only need X amount of pounds and a few thousand people that might need Y amount of pounds, or indeed not just uh, direct payments like that, but it might be uh, preferential access to training, IT, or other resources uh, that, that, that are clearly going to be coming forward uh, and rolling forward in the next few months. Yeah, no, I, I said to the Minister last week, uh, we were probably aggressive in our, our lobbying to get where we needed to be, but as a new group, we probably had to do that um, to bring the light that I felt that the group deserved and and needed. And I think one, one point I've noticed from the group, uh, and again, it's probably because it comes from the private sector and self-employed and that attitude of must get done, I have to say that there is no 
there is nothing that gets in the way of achieving what we want to achieve. There's no green or orange in the grip. There's no age in the grip. There's no sex in the grip. We are, we're all business people. And I think that's testament to where Northern Ireland's traveling as a, as a country or as a nation. Um, that those old ties that seem to be tying things up are dying out in the private sector. And it's really, it's really good to see that the arguments and the conversations that we have in the group are solely around economic growth. And when the economy grows, our pockets grow, our lives become better. Um, and, and the quality of jobs, I think that the two guys that brought at the start, um, the, that spoke very well. That was the, the quality of the jobs that we have in this sector are, are fantastic, and, and the people that are attached to it really are um, a pleasure to work with. Brian, thank you very much for the work that you've been doing, and um, I think you you will know that the commitment is here to continue to press this issue until we get a resolution of it. We are not going to go away. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, can we bring Claire into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, just uh, first, um, I don't believe it is a, a registered interest as such, but I just, for the sake of transparency, I just wanted to make people aware that um, Brian would have a connection to a member of my staff. Um, this is actually the first time I've been speaking with Brian. Um, yeah. and have met with him. So, um, Brian, uh, welcome to the committee. Um, I do appreciate everything that you have done on behalf of this group so far. It, it certainly has given us an awful lot of detail to be able to advocate um, for people like yourself. Um, and, and I've had a significant number of people within my constituency who have expressed uh, similar concerns and would hope that the, the government would come forward in supporting them. Um, I, I suppose I'm, I'm quite keen to hear uh, about your experience and your reasons why you would have moved from a PAYE job to self-employed and what benefits that brought to you, um, uh, I suppose, to your family life and, and other opportunities. Because I think, you know, when when we look at um, employment and, and, and self-employed and entrepreneurship, we do so on the basis that we can facilitate this new way of working because lives aren't nine to five anymore. And certainly in the area you work out, I worked on it myself a number of years ago, it isn't nine to five and it's not conducive to family life. You know, so all these things are being talked about by, you know, in, in other guises, but, you know, not supporting people like you who made that leap for reasons, you know, uh, other than than just, you know, becoming an entrepreneur. You know, I, I think it's important that the committee hears that because um, it, it's what other people will be thinking when, when they want to make that leap. But then, sadly, if they're going to become newly self-employed, if we were to find ourselves in another situation like this, like that, they may be discouraged. So I think it is important for you to share your experience as to why you chose to do that and what benefits that has to the economy, to childcare, to family life, and to all of those things. Um, yeah, it's nice to, to meet you, Claire. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing that, that, that drove me to make the move was, was family life. And I think that's really key in Northern Ireland. It drives a lot of things that we do. So um, probably missed out on a bit too much of um, my child growing up um, and not being able to, yes, support the house financially, but not be there as much as, as I would want to be. Um, really sparked an interest um, to making that leap across. Um, I, said, I, I saw a niche in the market with um, obviously a raise in national living wage that really affected our industry quite a lot in hospitality because there was a, a low paid um, workforce there. So as that cost went up, obviously people couldn't afford as many um, chefs or managers and stuff like that. So they cut back on their staff and I can really sort of fill in those gaps as and when they need me. Um, I enjoy what I do, but I can pick and choose my work. But like I said at the start, the, the, the biggest deciding factor for me was people that had already done what I was going to do. Um, and there isn't, a, you can never be too sure when you make these decisions to whether or not you'll be successful or not. Um, probably not having seven months of work has made reflecting back on that jump a wee bit more difficult because the figures aren't there to look at. But from what I experienced in the first six months 
uh, was very positive um, and I'm glad I made the jump. But the next person that comes to me, which they will do and asks, you know, is it worth it? My answer is not going to be the same answer that I got that made the jump. So therefore, it doesn't help grow um, this sort of small business and that taking that leap of faith. But that was the single. The, the reason why I made the decision to do it was based around family life. And the, the thing that made me cross over was um, a reference from somebody else that had done it. It wasn't a scheme to raise by Invest NI. It wasn't a slogan. It wasn't an advert on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, it was word of mouth. Yeah. No, and, and that was going to be my follow-up question, that, you know, if you had known then the lack of government support that would would not be forthcoming if, if we were to find ourselves in this situation, you know, would you take that leap? Um, and yeah, you, you've answered that in suggesting, no, that you potentially have to think twice about that. And I, th I think that's disappointing um, f from a, a government perspective, because, you know, they are talking about all other types of policies where they want to help families, they want to help parents, um, but they're not supporting them. So this isn't just about getting a return on any grants or investments they make. It's also about actually trying to serve the the people and the public and do and do the other parts of their job that are just as important and childcare does fall within that and family life does fall within that and employment um i, I suppose um another question I, I want to put to you too is that one of the points that i think sometimes the department probably tries to skim over if i'm going to be honest is the, the point around small medium enterprises and that is sole traders and self-employed people like yourself and i do believe that that underpins our entire economy and if we pull the rug from beneath um that uh sector within the economy then i think then we're going to have great difficulties but in six months to a year from now you know the, the minister's going to be announcing things in relation to recovery and how we recover in our economy and there's going to be a big part of that that will encourage new entrepreneurs but what confidence you know given someone who is newly an entrepreneur or newly self-employed what confidence would you have in in advising other people to take that leap into into, into self-employment um when if again this thing would happen you know um they wouldn't be supported and it's actually really risky in the world that we now live in so d do we encourage entrepreneurship anymore or or do we do we hold back anticipating another pandemic or, or something similar? Well, I think, um, I think the economic recovery plan that came out with a 73 million pound worth of bids really is based around promoting, um, when we haven't got out of where we are, uh, I think the ministers maybe went a wee bit too early with that. Uh, and certainly that support now to hold on to what we have, would be a massive advertisement going forward to promote new business uh, and to, you know the, the the private sector doesn't really rely on the economy minister too much in fairness you know we 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 drive ourselves on um we we work um we work independently away from that um but whenever we do need to turn to the economy minister and the economy department i think it is key that they are there to to help when need be mm -hmm. uh, and that again that is the biggest advertisement you can have for support is actually given support um, and that in itself will grow the confidence that um, Northern Ireland needs to invest in um, SMEs which are mm -hmm. you said oh well, I think it from our figures it's 94 percent um, which is a pretty big number um, and I would certainly if I was driving economic growth um, I would want that number on side as a total rather than bits and pieces. Yeah, and I do think there is an opportunity, particularly for using the minister's language around recovery, to um, support current entrepreneurs through an investment scheme, maybe through invest. I this happens all the time. You know, businesses connected with Invest and I are able to apply for schemes of up to five thousand pounds that will help them facilitate their business. So, so why not potentially look at this as an opportunity to reinvest in the people who have already established themselves as a business, um, rather than just looking at this as hardship and, and wondering whether they will get a return or not. Because, you know, if, if these businesses continue to exist, of course they're going to get a return. They're, 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 um, invest, they themselves are investing in our economy. And I think that's where the thinking has to come from. You know, I, I think 
maybe we do need to take a more positive stance from this, um, given where we are and given where the, the executive's focus now seems to be. Um, but I do think there are opportunities for a positive investment um, in, in those businesses that are, are, are already there, rather than trying to encourage new ones, um, you know, leading them down a garden path where they won't be supported if this were to happen again. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Claire. Um, i move on then to Jagari and just um, not trying to rush anybody, but we have to be out of this room before half past. So um, if we try and keep it as succinct as possible, because we've still a, a fair bit to get through. No problem. Chair, um, the benefit of, I suppose, being in my office is that I don't have to vacate this room. Uh, so <laughs> I could keep you for a while. Um, Brian, thanks uh, for, for, for being here. And we've all been supportive of ensuring that, that you are heard. Uh, at the committee, uh, and, and I think that is very important. Um, in terms of the the thirty thousand potential uh, people involved, and I appreciate that that may be the upper limit, and not all of those people re will require maybe the same level of support. Uh, maybe none may require support at all. Uh, in some cases, uh, if they're, uh, as I say, if they've if they've um, if they're back uh, and, and opened again and, and, and working. In terms of your views around um, the sort of a targeted type approach, you know, where are the, you know, in terms of your own grouping, where are the specific um, maybe sectors that you see as, as, as almost being the largest grouping within that 30,000? Um, well, I think the, the taxi drivers were were probably the biggest group with the child minders that, that needed the support. Uh, and it was great to see the executive coming down and, and being proactive um, I know we'll say seven months down the line, proactive is maybe not the best word to use. Um, then you go into your, uh, your B&Bs as well as another one where they really do drive a massive revenue through. So a tailored support towards them um, will go a long way to supporting tourism, which we know is, is a big um, sector in Northern Ireland. Uh, and then the newly self-employed, I think, is another one that, like I've said throughout the meeting, the, the free advertising and marketing that comes from successful businesses that are working successfully with the economy department um, is fantastic. Uh, the word of mouth is, um, is a common phrase in Northern Ireland for anything, and it's certainly no different within uh, the private sector. The word of mouth really does um, carry a lot of clout. Uh, and one, um, he, uh, the being of my life, probably TripAdvisor, uh, one negative review outweighs 10 positives um, and that I tend to do that and break it into things that, that, that I understand and, and certainly the average person can understand but um, one negative business um, experience with the economy department uh, will have a true detrimental effect going forward. Okay, um, I, I think the Department for the Economy you know, has got a, a clear um, and consistent message, I think. Um, the, the motion yesterday certainly was, uh, well, did pass unanimously. I think it is important that the Department do uh, the necessary work. And I do appreciate that there's frustration around um, maybe the length of time that that has taken. Uh, there'd be frustration around maybe um, the, the capacity involved in, in, in pulling all this stuff together. But look, I think it is important that uh, as a committee we continue to uh, press on this issue. Uh, I also think it is important that we do not get into a position where uh, we are trying to bid uh, one minister against the other. I, I'm speaking as elected reps as, as opposed to anything else because I have heard the commentary around, well, just put in a bid and then it'll be up to the finance minister. Don't get me wrong, uh, politically that may be the, the, the quick thing to do because you just put in a bid and say, well, that's your problem. But I think in terms of an executive and the economy minister absolutely has a role to play, so it's, it's not about taking it off uh, her remit. But I think that if there's a collective strategic position within the executive as well, I think that, that will help the case. But I just want to say, look, we as a committee, uh, you know, we've heard the views, uh, we, we have raised it, and, and I don't think uh, it's not anybody's intention that we almost ignore the issue and it will go away. Uh, I don't think that anybody's under under any illusion that that you know will ever happen. I think it is important that you know we, we, we take all of the views on board. So thanks, Brian, for that. Cheers, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Um, John. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, Brian, in, in my previous life, I worked as a chef for twenty years, so I know sure. how, I know I know the mentality of chefs, and it, it, you need to get the job done, and you need to move on to get the next job done. 
Uh, so look, uh, without holding you back any further, you know you have our support. I'm still of the view the decision has been made not to support you. It's the wrong decision. However, I think yesterday's uh, debate in the Assembly was quite significant. Um, the unanimous support across the Chamber uh, for this, I think, has placed the Minister in a very difficult and uncomfortable position. But I don't think, in fairness, the, they set out to pick on your sector. The strategy, in my opinion, is wrong. The economic recovery strategy is wrong. It is too focused on a strategy which would have suited the economy in 2019. We need a strategy that suits the economy in 2020, and the first half of 2021, perhaps. And it goes back to what you said earlier. What we have, we hold. We need to, we need to secure the jobs we have and then look towards uh, those, those growth sectors, in, which is a small and medium enterprise. And I welcome the fact that one of the economists earlier on said that he now expected Invest NI to now look more inwards at small and medium enterprises as the basis of the economy, rather than chasing the bright lights of... New York or Shanghai, wherever it may be. We will have to go there again, but uh, use guys are the foundation of our economy and we need to get the support out to you. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Sinead, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Thank you very much, um, Brian, for coming along and uh, addressing the committee today. And it's important um, that you continue to shine a light on those that have been left behind. Um, I really don't have any questions uh, for you today, apart from the fact that um, obviously, you know, you've got the support of the committee behind you. Uh, and we too believe that, you know, it's much harder to start a business, um, uh, you know, and, and what we need to do is protect those that are already started. It's not about new businesses. It's about the existing businesses. So, um, I, again, uh, just welcome you here today and um, we will continue to support you. Thank you very much, Sinead. Okay. Sinead, thanks for that. Um, Brian, thank you very much for your time this morning. And I think you, you've heard a, a strong message from, from members across the committee um, in relation to our support. And we will continue to do what we can as a committee um, to highlight the, this issue and, and to hopefully find um, a, a resolution to it. So thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Good luck, folks. Okay, Brian. So, um, members, we are a bit pushed for time, so we're going to defer some of the agenda to, to next week. Um, but I, I want to move us on to item 9.9 .9 in your pack. Um, members will have received correspondence, um, and it's at page 83 of your table papers from the chairperson of Belcou Frac Free regarding research being considered by the department into petroleum licensing. There's a response from the department at page 86 to concerns raised um, and the uh, research um, and the associated research stu study and tender documents are there. And I'm just opening it up for myself here as well. Um, so there is also a, an FAQ document by DFE on petroleum licensing at page 229 of your table papers and a copy of the May petroleum licensing application consultation from May 2019 at page 258 of your table papers. Um, I, I have to say I, I, I'm a bit um, amused by, by what is contained within the, um, the, the specification from the research, um, in particular in relation to scenario th th 3, um, which talks about increased demand and I, I think given the context of the climate emergency that we face um, and the huge opposition that there is to, to fracking in particular, um, I think that, that this is, is misguided. So if members are content that we um, write to the Minister to get an urgent update on the issue raised in, in the correspondence and the paperwork. Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so we're moving on then. Um, item number 10 is any other businesses, and we have not um, indicated. Flagged up. No. no. Okay. Um, okay. We can leave that. So we're moving on then to item number 11, which is the date, time, and place of the next meeting, and that is next Wednesday morning um, in room 30. So thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.